10 o'clock. What the government is doing now is bordering on the very dangerous, to be perfectly honest. It is robbing people of hope. It is robbing people of something to look forward to. And it is very, very stupid and very, very short-sighted. The Tory lockdown rebels. More than 60 MPs write to the PM demanding that all restrictions are lifted once the top nine groups have been vaccinated. I'm optimistic. I won't hide it from you. I'm optimistic. But we have to be cautious. And I'll be sending out uh, the roadmap, as I say, on the 22nd. This morning there is consensus in the papers that schools will return in three weeks and restrictions on outdoor meetings could be eased. Those over 50 represent 99% of the death, death risk. Once vaccinated, is there a need for any legal restrictions to remain in place? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 10 o'clock, the Foreign Secretary is refusing to rule out the introduction of coronavirus vaccine passports to be used in places including supermarkets and pubs across the UK. The government is already considering if people should have them if they travel abroad to show they've had an inoculation. Dominic Raab has told Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC they're keeping all options open. It's something that hasn't been ruled out and it's under consideration, but of course you've got to make it workable. And you, When I've looked at this, whether it's on the international, the domestic or the local uh, level, you've got to to know that the document that, that is being presented is something that you can rely on as an accurate reflection of the status of the individual. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's a foolproof answer in the way that sometimes it's presented, but of course we'll look at all the options. Donald Trump is now free to run for the US presidency again after senators acquitted him in his second impeachment trial. The House didn't reach the two-thirds majority needed to find him guilty of inciting rioters in Washington DC last month. His son Donald Trump Jr. says the Democrats should now move on. Now maybe they've gotten all of the nonsense out of their system. The Democrats can actually go back to doing some work. A group of MPs is urging the government to ban China from making equipment for Britain's armed forces. The Defence Subcommittee says the use of overseas firms in the UK supply chain leaves it open to what it claims is hostile foreign involvement. Tobias Elwood is chair of the Defence Select Committee. He has his reasons to be cautious about China. It doesn't follow WTO rules. It doesn't to operate its own country in the same way that we do ours with a weaker population. We've seen that. And when it comes to doing business, there's also a huge concern about intellectual property theft of stealing data, stealing ideas and so forth. And when it comes to our defence and to our aerospace industries, this is absolutely critical. The US Supreme Court has agreed to the extradition of an American father and son wanted by Japan over the escape of Carlos Ghosn, the former chief executive and chairman of the Renault Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance of Car Companies. Companies. Michael and Peter Taylor have been in a suburban jail in Boston since their arrest last May. Reports say an undersea tunnel between Great Britain and Northern Ireland could be approved by the government next month. The Sunday Telegraph says the connection would link Stranra in Scotland and Larne in Northern Ireland. American and Egyptian archaeologists have unearthed what could be the oldest known beer factory at one of the most prominent historic sites of ancient Egypt. It has been found on an ancient burial ground in the desert west of the Nile River, more than 280 miles south of Cairo. The weather, patchy rain and snow across the north of the UK across this morning, that ahead of heavier rain to come later, cloudy elsewhere and feeling raw in the southeasterly wind, a high of 6 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Philip Krisikas. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Just gone 10. Hello, good morning, welcome to the show. You're listening to Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this Valentine's Day. Coming up, you love to see it. The government set the to hit the target of vaccinating the most clinically vulnerable by mid-February, an astonishing effort which has been a morale boost during these dark months and means, according to the papers, schools will be back on March the 8th. 
pubs could reopen on March the 30th and meeting people outdoors will be possible again. I have to say, it does feel this weekend like we're winning. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you, and yet there are, of course, ways of winning. A triumphalist flinging open of the doors with a nation sprinting for the nearest watering hole and dancing in the streets is probably too risky for most, and yet a slower, more cautious, lengthy reopening would be disproportionate to the risks presented by COVID. A much diminished risk, certainly, when all those groups over the age of 50 have been vaccinated. For over 60 Conservative MPs, any restrictions lasting beyond that point will not feel like winning at all. The COVID recovery group of backbench Conservative MPs writing to the Prime Minister today saying all restrictions remaining after the 8th of March should be proportionate to the ever-increasing number of people we have protected. Uh, they add that the burden of proof should be on ministers to show restrictions are necessary. And once all over 50s are jabbed, possibly by the end of April, they suggest all COVID laws must be removed. The leader of the COVID recovery group is Mark Harper. He joins me live. Thank you for coming on the programme uh, this morning, Mr Harper. Um, tell us what restrictions would you say were disproportionate after the 8th of March? Well, the, what we've done, we set out a very careful process in our letter to tie the removal of restrictions to the rollout of the vaccine. So we're not setting an arbitrary timetable. We're tying it very much to the success in the vaccine rollout, which has fan gone fantastically well. But of course, the point of that is it's protecting the most vulnerable people from death and hospitalisation. So what we've said is once the first four groups, they're all going to have been vaccinated this weekend, are fully protected from that first dose, it takes two or three weeks to kick in. So that's by the 8th of March, you start relaxing restrictions and you can get children back to school and then mm -hmm. progressively you can relax restrictions as the vaccine rollout continues once you've done the first nine groups and of course it's not just over 50s it's everyone over 50 but it's also those between 16 and 64 who have a health condition that makes them vulnerable to covid once you've protected yep. all of those people who make up 99% of those who died from COVID and over 80% of those that have been hospitalised. We don't think there's a case for legal restrictions remaining in place at all. After all, remember that all these rules were put in place to save lives and protect the NHS. And actually the life saving and the NHS protecting is going to be done by the vaccine, not by these restrictions. Isn't that exactly what the government plans to do though? Uh, well, I hope it's what the government plans to do. Um, the vaccine rollout... Well, what what have, have they said, said the thus far that leads you to think that it might not be, Mr Harper? What, what, what worries you about the government's response so far that makes you think that they're going to do something different to what you would like? Well, because the government has committed to start uh, relaxing restrictions on the 8th of March. That was something we called for some time ago, and I'm very pleased that they've done that. But they haven't yet suggested that they're going to move in lockstep with the rollout of the vaccination. And the problem at the moment is you keep hearing people uh, from uh, SAGE, for example, coming out and being uh, suggesting that we're still going to have restrictions all the way through the summer and perhaps have them again in the winter. Um, and we're not hearing ministers counter that. So, look, if the Prime Minister comes out on the 22nd of February and sets out something broadly like we've called for in the letter, you know, I'll be incredibly happy. I'd love to be able to stand up in the House of Commons and welcome the roadmap that he hmm. sets out uh, on a week Monday. Um, and, and, and so will all the colleagues that have signed the letter. Yes. Um, we're just setting out that's what we think the government should do. But, Mr Harper, you are, you are obviously, you're not an epidemiologist unless you're about to reveal some, some past career in which you uh, uh, saw yourself, you know, studying the, the spread of diseases. Is the point that you're making a health policy point or a legal point, a, a, a legislative point? Because a lot of people would say we don't need advice, thank you, from the, uh, about the spread of diseases from a politician. We want to hear from the scientists no. about that. Well, look, you, government has to listen and MPs have to listen to advice from scientists about... Uh, the epidemiology, uh, and I absolutely do. But it's also the job of politicians and the government to balance that against the harms and the costs of lockdowns. And we know there are many harms and costs of lockdowns on people's mental health, uh, on businesses, 
on livelihoods and all of those these children not being at school there's clear evidence now that there's enormous harm from that and we have to balance those things now what we've done is looked at the information from the vaccination from the trials from the real world evidence that we're starting to see in israel which is which is about the only country that's ahead of us in vaccinating people and it is having the effects that we see which is protecting people from death and from serious disease And, and as that takes effect that's the basis on which we should relax restrictions and the government's moving ahead very very fast and will have protected all of the vulnerable groups by the end of april yes i understand that but the i'm just trying to drive at whether or not you think it's disproportionate to have in legislation a law that says after those groups have been vaccinated you need to wear a mask if you're in a, a, a enclosed space like a supermarket or something or whether you think the the very act of even if one were to choose to wear a mask in a supermarket should not be should not be needed after that point but that's a health point whereas the other one is i think a, a legislative point is that what you see as disproportionate here well, there's, there's a couple of things there. That first of all, I don't see a great case for legal restrictions uh, on, on what people do. But on the point about whether uh, face masks uh, and any social distancing uh, makes sense in terms of the advice that the government wants to give, yeah. um, I'm very happy to listen to the science. The point is, though, once you've vaccinated uh, all of the vulnerable groups, then you're not going to see significant numbers of people being seriously ill mm. or hospitalised or dying from COVID. Those, those, and that is the basis on which these restrictions yes. were Although put some in of the place. scientists, some of the scientists have worried about if there are lots of cases, even if it doesn't translate into hospitalisation once the vaccination programme is rolled out to all those groups, the number of cases can affect the number of different variants that pop up. And if there's a variant that manages to get around the vaccine, we're back to square one. Well, the government's own position now, as set out by the health secretary in the House of Commons last week, is that infection rates are not one of the tests that the government's going to use when it's deciding on the roadmap. Uh, Matt Hancock made it very clear. It's death rates, hospitalisations, the progress of the vaccine rollout. And of course, the government's Mm. keeping a weather eye on the variants that exist and the effects that that vaccines still have on them. And the government only this last week and the scientists confirmed that at the moment, all of the variants uh, are dealt with by the vaccine. So Uh, lockdown measures decided on number of cases. So the government itself has said, well, the, the government itself has said that it's not going to use infection rates okay. as the measure for relaxing restrictions. And, you know, that, that's uh, what the health secretary set out in the House of Commons yep. just this last week. Clearly, the, the government is looking at how the world operates, how we all operate once this um, starts to ease and we, we get back to normal lives. There's been lots of back and forth about the need for international COVID passports. I want to play this to you if I can, though. I spoke a bit earlier to the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, about the possibility of the government looking at domestic Co- um, vaccine passports that you might need to show a bit of paper to walk into a, a supermarket or to a restaurant. Here's, here's what so he said. Domestically, it won't be needed. You don't think a, a domestic vaccine passport where you have to show a bit of paper to go into a supermarket or something like that? Well, it's something that hasn't been ruled out and it's under consideration, but oh. of course you've got to make it workable. And you've got to, I think the thing with when, when I've looked at this, whether it's on the international, or domestic, or the local uh, level, you've got to know that the, the document that, that is being uh, presented is something that you can rely on, that it uh, has an accurate reflection of the status of the individual. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's a foolproof. Uh, answer uh, in the way that sometimes it's presented, but of course we'll look at all the options. Okay. Decided, Mr. Harper, but certainly they're 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 looking at the possibility of introducing a scheme like that. How would you feel about it? Well, well, I think on the whole issue of vaccine passports, I think there's two separate issues there that you touched on uh, the, with the foreign secretary. Uh, as far as international travel is concerned, clearly other countries are entitled to have rules um, about what you have to do before you enter their country. And so clearly, if countries require you to have a COVID vaccination, that's entirely up to them. And what people will need to be able to evidence that. In the UK, I don't think we want to get to a position where we're telling people they can't do things unless they've been vaccinated with COVID. You might require them to be tested, for example, um, but what I don't think care we workers? want to get to a position workers in, in Workers in care homes or hospitals, if they've unfortunately the figures don't look brilliant for um, take up amongst care workers. Um, if someone hasn't been vaccinated and, and wants to work in a care home, should they be allowed to? 
Well, I think you have to very much look at the risk uh, that people present. Um, there are, uh, my own view is that if you're a healthcare worker, it should be possible to persuade you to have a vaccination based on the very clear evidence. This is something the NHS will have to look at because clearly yeah. the priority is protecting um, the residents in the care home. Uh, and you have to look at the extent to which that person then presents a risk. Yeah. But for, for everyday life, I don't think you want to require people to have to have a particular medical procedure before they can go about their day-to-day -day life. That's not how we do things in Britain. But obviously internationally, that's up yeah. to other countries what they require to enter their countries. And obviously we'll have to comply with that if we wish to travel abroad. Very finally, um, what are the political implications of the government doing something that you don't agree with and don't like? Uh, as you say, you've got 60 MPs signed up to this. It's not enough to overturn the government's majority. What's the threat here? I mean, if the government don't follow what you're asking for, what, what can you actually do? Well, I, I've, I've written a letter very much in, in, the, in the spirit of uh, an optimistic tone, the sort of tone the Prime Minister's been striking over the last couple of days. So rather than look on the... Uh, the, the negative side, uh, Tom. I'd rather look on the positive side. We've given the Prime Minister here a sense of what we what we want. So a shot to see. across the bow. Uh, I very much hope. Well, I very much hope on the twenty second of February he'll stand up in the House of Commons and set out a roadmap um, that doesn't look a, a million miles away from this, which we can then enthusiastically support, um, and we can have a united country and united party as we move forward. And I hope that's very much the position we'll be in. Very good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the programme. Mark Harper, chair of the Covid Recovery Group, Conservative MP for the Forest of Dean, former chief whip under David Cameron, knows a thing or two about corralling those MPs. He's got 60 of them to write this letter saying that this is what they would like the government to do, that there is no justification for having restrictions in law after the point that all over 50s, those top nine groups, have been vaccinated at some point, hopefully by the end of April. I wonder whether you agree. 0345 6060973. If people want to wear a mask, absolutely fine. If you want to stay distanced, be my guest. We're all going to have to take different measures. We're all probably going to live our lives a bit differently, certainly spacing out from people, washing your hands at that stage. But once the 99% of the death risk has been vaccinated, once 80 plus percent of the hospitalisation risk has been vaccinated, do we need restrictions that are punishable by, by the legislation uh, to keep COVID numbers down. 0345 6060 973. Tom Swarbrick in L on LBC will speak to uh, a member, a, a professor from NerveTag in just a few moments, as well as your calls. It's 1017. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 Oh, uh, very good morning to you. 20 past 10 is the time. Tom Swarbrick here, Swarbrick on Sunday, where there is good news around this morning. I mean, the fact that it looks as if schools are going to reopen in some form, it's not exactly clear whether it would be a partial reopening or whether they'll all go back at once on March the 8th, is I think at least something to work towards if you spent the last few months uh, trying to juggle homeschooling and working from home as well. There are changes coming to outdoors and whether or not we're able to sit on a park bench with someone who's not in our household. That seems to be something that the government might look at lifting in the near future, given the speed and efficacy of the vaccine rollout. Um, What it does mean, though, is that you are getting Conservative MPs, and I suggest quite a lot of others, saying, well, once we've got rid of the risk, 88% of the hospitalisation risk vaccinated by the end of April, all being well, 99% of the risk of death in those groups who are more um, vulnerable, they will have been vaccinated by the end of April, all being well. What then the need for restrictions to govern how we live our lives. If you want to wear a mask, fine. If you want to stay socially distanced, absolutely your call. But do we need the government to legislate for that and to criminalise behaviour that should really be a personal choice at that point? 0345 6060 Let's get to your calls. Cornelius is in Swansea this morning. Cornelius. Morning. How are you? I'm very well, sir. What Do you, do you find yourself agreeing with the COVID recovery group, so-called? Well, I mean, the people in Sage, I think, obviously, they're looking at, uh, you know, the, obviously, the infection rate and the death rate, et cetera. But I go back to the very beginning on the first daily briefing from these people from Sage and the medical advisors. They said from the very beginning that the majority of people catching this illness would be a minor illness. Now, they know over the last 12 months with all the data that they've got that sadly, and I use the word sadly, that the death rate of people with this pandemic are, are around 82 years of age, not 32 or 42. It's 82. the average age of death, yeah. Right. Now then, the R rate that they are talking about is the circulation of the infection within our community. But if they have vaccinated the majority or all the people that are of an age group and the vulnerable, the R rates should only be looked mm. upon of those that are still increasing increasing going into hospital because like any other flu you will have flu going through the community but that doesn't mean you're going to be ending up in an ICU unit if the vulnerable I, yeah. and, have, have already been protected well Cornelius I, I think I think you're I think you're right uh, on the face of it that to me seems completely logical We're locking down to protect the NHS. Once the NHS is largely protected by the vaccine programme, why then the need to lock down? So I I completely agree with you on that point. There are, though, as you know, scientists, sage scientists who say, well, yes, of course, hospitalisation and death is one measure that we need to be uh, very, very aware of. But we also need to take heed of the number of cases that are circulating as we grow to live with this thing. Uh, And if there are too many cases, more people will end up in hospital, unfortunately. Uh, But of course, there is the possibility of a variant popping up. No, I thought, sorry, I, I disagree with that because, first of all, the, 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 the younger generation that is catching this virus that, that has been documented is like a very strong flu. By doing it that way, you're building up herd immunity, which you need to do anyway in order for this the spread to mm. be minimised. And I honestly feel now, because of these new variants, these surge people are, are, are jumping on it like, like, like it's the first virus and showing more concern about variants than the actual issue that we've got to address. All flus have got different forms of variants, but it's still the vulnerable and the elderly, mm. sadly, are the ones that are more susceptible. I, and I'm, regarding I'm, NHS yeah. workers and regarding um, care workers, I've been an engineer in the oil industry for many years. If I have had to take inoculations like hepatitis A, hepatitis B, diphtheria, etc., before I could get a work permit to work mm. in projects around the world. Now, if well, listen, Cornelius, workers, I, I, we, we, we'll come on to that point about uh, vaccination and, and the documents required a bit later, I promise. But listen, uh, broadly, I, I, I agree with you, actually. I don't see... If the logic of locking down has been because we need to protect the NHS, once the NHS is protected largely, mainly through this vaccination programme, why the need to lock down? If people want to choose to wear a mask, 
please be my guest. I have to say, I don't think I'll ever go on a on a tube, crowded tube train ever again without wearing one. Cornelius, thank you. 0345 6060 973 is the number. 1025. Let's turn to Professor Robert Dingwall, Professor of Sociology at Nottingham Trent University, a member of NerveTag, the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group, and is speaking to us this morning in a personal capacity. Professor, thank you for coming on the programme. Um, let's start with getting schools back this date of March the 8th. Um, do you think it would be wise to see all schools return at the same time, given the pressing need to get children back into education? Well, I think we need to separate out two things here. I mean, one is the really pressing need to get getting children back. And I mean, March the 8th is an, an utterly conservative date for starting to do that, because the uh, the immune the immune status, the immunity of the vaccinated population will be at a high level by the end of next week anyway. So it could um, really be sooner. It, well, it certainly could. It it could justifiably be at the end of half term, um, but the prime minister seems set on taking a, an even more conservative position than the, the, the necessary, um, and so it does. Why do you like, think that is? Well, I think in part it is the the desire to make sure that this is the last lockdown. In in part, I think he is still. Um, being perhaps overly influenced by a section of the scientific advisory network that you know takes the the most conservative position on this, uh, you know as you might expect, there's a spectrum of opinions. I'm mm. speaking in a personal capacity and giving mine, uh, but uh, other members of the network are perhaps uh, a, a little more cautious, uh, a little more. Do you think there's uh, over caution amongst those elements in the in the scientific community? Well, I think as a, as a sociologist, I'm perhaps more sensitive to the wider harms of, of lockdown, uh, to the, the, the trade-offs between fighting just one infection and mm. you know, dealing with all of the other causes of, of death and ill health and the, you know, the, the psychological impact on, on the population, especially on the child population. I wonder, though, if the government has been saying that getting schools back is its number one priority, uh, given the damage being done to, to younger people not being in school, whether that holds true, if it is indeed the case, that they're being very, very small c conservative uh, about when to reopen them. Well, I think that we <coughs> we need to press on with, with, with again, reopen. We also need to think that what, what are we doing when we reopen them? And... Um, I, again, I think we need a little more imagination here. There's no point in reopening them as exam factories. The sorts of damage that we've been doing to children for the, the last 12 months, they need to get ready to learn again. And that applies at all levels. You know, we need time for social activity. We need time for play. We need time for creative arts. We need time for games and outdoor experiences. You know, I want to hear the museums and galleries full of school parties. Um, you know, and, and you know the talk of well, you know, will it will make the terms longer, will make the day longer, and will cram more content in? I mean, that's really is a, a misunderstanding of uh, what what it takes for children to recover and for children to be ready to learn. And I, I think, <laughs> frankly. Yeah. Sure. And are you talking about all ages there, Professor? Are you talking, I, I can, you know, I'm thinking of my, my own two. Uh, I've got a six-year-old and three-year-old and the, a gradual easing back into to school and remembering how to sit in a classroom again might be very helpful. But for the older age group, that's not necessary, is it? Or, or do you think it is? Well, I think an element of that is, uh, is important. Again, you know, children's... Uh, you know, children continue to develop, children's brains are continuing to develop, children are continuing to develop so socially and psychologically well into their teenage years. And I, I think it's really unhelpful to think that the, you know, the first thing that we have to do when we get children back in school is to start uh, kind of cramming them for exams again. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they won't be ready to do that. And yeah, you know, I think we should really write off mo much of the rest of the the school year to, you know, repairing the damage to children rather than insisting on driving forward with mm. you know, learning this, that, and the next thing. How would you, uh, uh, again, as a sociologist, how would you measure and how would you describe what you see as the damage done to um, children by being out of school for so long? Well, what we're seeing is, uh, you know. 
uh, my, I mean, this is much uh, from my colleagues in psychology or from uh, child health, but we're, you know, we are seeing problems with, with sleep disorders, suicidal thoughts, loneliness, the, you know, the failure to develop appropriate kinds of social relationship. You know, I've got grandchildren the same age as yours. And, you know, my six-year-old grandson has not spoken to another child of his own age uh, mm. for, for, for several months. Mm. Uh, you know, that's not good for his, his social skills uh, and, or for his, his development. Um, uh, and therefore the need to get schools back as quickly as possible. Might, it might surprise some in your own community, Professor, to hear you say they should, should be open sooner. I, I think it's... Well, I think what we're talking about here is always a balance of risk, but particularly with primary school children, the, you know, the evidence is that you know, they do not suffer uh, fr from COVID to any great extent. Their schools are not centres of transmission and risk. Um, no, we're going into a point where a lot of the 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 risk, the, the, a lot of the damage that's going to be done when they go back is going to be about the obsessive control attempts to continue obsessively controlling infection. Um, I've got a four and a half year old grandson who comes, who, who's, his mother's a key worker, but he comes home and cries because his hands are so sore from the amount of sanitising that the that the school is demanding when when he is in there. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that we have to stop. Um, we have to Good. accept that, 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 you know, we're trying to get schools back and we're trying to get schools yeah. back on a normal footing. Very good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Professor Robert Dingwall, Professor of Sociology at Nottingham Trent University, a member of NerveTag, the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group. We'll talk more about schools reopening uh, in about half an hour's time. The former Education Secretary Justine Greening is going to be joining us as well. Speak to Labour's Shadow Health Secretary Jonathan Ashworth and, and in a few moments you'll hear from the Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. It's Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. 10.31 is the time. Your news headlines come from Philip Krisikos. The Foreign Secretary says ministers are considering COVID vaccine passports for use here and abroad. Dominic Raab has refused to rule them out on Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. Their use domestically would be in places including supermarkets and pubs across the UK. Donald Trump is welcoming his second impeachment acquittal after Democrats failed to reach the two-thirds majority needed to secure a conviction. The former US president had been charged with incitement of insurrection over last month's riots in Washington, D.C. A ban on bailiffs evicting renters in England is being extended until the end of next month to try to help people struggling financially because of the pandemic. It was supposed to end a week tomorrow. The weather, patchy rain and snow across the north of the UK this morning, ahead of heavier rain this afternoon, cloudy elsewhere and feeling raw in the southeasterly wind, a high of six degrees. This is LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Morning to you. Stephen's been in touch uh, with the programme this morning. Tom, have you seen the latest statistics on long COVID and how they affect children? There are some harrowing stories starting to appear and so little known about long COVID says Steve. I I agree with you. It's awful. If you've got long, it must be absolutely horrific. Unfortunately, we don't lock down an entire nation on the basis of people becoming uh, unwell and require it, but even requiring hospitalisation in the numbers that we would see once all those over 50 have been vaccinated. The numbers, in theory, hopefully, fingers crossed, should drop off a cliff. And at that point, that's when the restrictions have to start coming off pretty fast, isn't it? 0345 973 A little earlier this morning, I spoke with Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary uh, and Conservative MP for Isha and Walton. And I started by asking him about this. And why would legally enforceable measures need to stay in place once everyone over 50 has been vaccinated? Well, we want to get to a position where 99% of those who are at risk of dying from this appalling virus have been offered their first dose by the end of April. We're making really good progress. We hope to hit tomorrow. We're confident we will hit the first milestone, getting the first uh, 15 million offered their first dose in the priority groups one to four. But I think you've got to gauge the evidence as we go, Mm -hmm. rather than just setting a target and saying, come what may. Uh, So we'll gauge the impact that those measures have on the virus. And uh, we'll take as many of the steps we can to open up starting the schools on the 8th of March. But the scientists are quite clear that there might need to be some measures that exist after that point, whether it's social distancing or mask wearing in various circumstances. Why would it need to be legally enforced, though? That seems to be the issue here. Why, why does it need to be in law at that, at that point? Well, you're right that we do need some room for manoeuvre. So it's not entirely clear yet in advance of... Uh, that stage, what measures would need in place, and of course you'd want the law to back it up. So the the, the smart thing to do is, as we said all along, is we, we hit our first milestone, uh, we, we hope and we're confident tomorrow. We have a review on the 22nd of February, the Prime Minister will set out as much of the data transparently as possible, and we'll start looking forward, including with uh, the opening of schools on the 8th of March. Okay. But I don't think you can prejudge the evidence as we get it in. No, I understood, but the idea that there will be some legally uh, enforced restrictions in place or wearing of masks or whatever it might be, that that's a possibility once the 99% of the death risk have been vaccinated. Well, let's see how we go, because what we need to ascertain is the impact that the vaccine has on not just the uh, the virus, uh, but also the impact it has on hospital admissions and things like that. So that's where we want, of course, to get to, but we've got to be evidence-based, as we've said throughout Um, There are a whole slew of of deadlines and dates in the newspapers. It might just be quicker for me to ask, are any of them accurate? Whether schools go back on on March the 8th, pubs on March the 30th, what would you pick out from those dates and say, yes, that accords with my understanding of what's going on in government right now? The first uh, date, which is important, is tomorrow. We're confident we're on track to have 15 million uh, of the high priority, four top priority groups offered the first vaccine by then. Then Monday week, the 22nd of February, that date, which is talked about in the papers, is clearly when the PM will set out both the progress we've made, but also the plans uh, going forward. And 8th of March uh, is the date when we want to start getting schools back open um, and is the first uh, and highest priority, probably, in terms of the easing out of the lockdown. Yes. And what is the plan for mass testing in schools, for rapid testing to get those schools open and to keep them open safely? Well, again, the the detail on, I mean, the testing has uh, been a a huge part of the approach that we've taken, along with the vaccination um, and uh, the the other measures. And the PM will set out the the interplay between all of them on the 22nd, as far as schools are concerned. But there is definitely still a plan to do mass testing, quick fire testing in schools to keep them safe and keep them open. The PM will set out all of that detail on the 22nd. Yeah. I wonder then, as we as we um, find a way through this and come out the other side of this, whether you would agree, uh, Mr. Rob, that we should never, ever, ever have to lock down in this way ever again. Of course, no one wants to have to lock down this way again. We learn the lessons uh, both from the out- uh, outset of uh, the lockdown, so that what we did last year as well as what we're doing this year. And of course, what, what you've seen uh, 
some of the Asian countries were better prepared. They'd been through uh, SARS and other pandemics. I, I'm confident that because of the learning that, that, that we're constantly accumulating, we'll be better placed should, God forbid, uh, we face another pandemic of the, of, the, of the same likes in the future. Yes, yeah, so it's, but, it's, but your assessment is that it's unlikely at the moment that we would need to lock down in this way again in the short to medium term because of the vaccines, because of the testing, because of the distancing, because of the, the treatments. Oh, if we look in, in terms of uh, coronavirus, then uh, of course, by rolling out the vaccine and taking, if you like, the fatalities out of it, which is the whole point of getting the top nine priority groups uh, offered the first dose by the end of April, that allows us to move into a whole different place in relation to managing uh, the pandemic. And yes, of course, we want to avoid, uh, unless it was for whatever reason, absolutely essential, or we will take every uh, every step, every effort to avoid any the national lockdowns, of course. Um, let me ask you about the G7. You, you are the Prime Minister hosting a virtual meeting of G7 leaders. You will have been doing a lot of the legwork on this. Um, will vaccine passports be something that's agreed amongst G7 leaders internationally? So that's something that will, will I'm sure be considered both domestically but also the impacts internationally. You're, of course, you need to get a lot of countries uh, being able to agree the workability of it and how they would verify what, go, what, what is being relied upon in relation to passport. The, the thing the Prime Minister can set out very clearly is the leadership that we're taking hmm. in making sure there can be an equitable access to the vaccine right around the world, including the poorest, most vulnerable countries. And we've taken a lead in this area. We've put in half a billion pounds. We've secured a billion doses for the so-called COVAX AMC mechanism. We want to use, the Prime Minister will use, our convening power at the G7 level, also in the UN Security Council, because we hold the presidency of that yep. this month, to encourage other countries to step up to the plate because we need a global solution to what is a yes. global problem. Um, and uh, uh, that is incredibly important and we wait to see what, what falls out of the G7 on that. Just back on the vaccine passports, clearly this is something that's going to have to be agreed internationally, which the government is now making signs that it's looking at. What's though to stop a company in this country demanding that in order to enter a restaurant or in order to go into a pub in the future, that someone produce a document saying that they've got a vaccine? <laughs> Well, in terms of the law that would apply, that's something that's the prerogative of the government and parliament. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that there's enough confidence in the national rollout that when we're in a position to open non-essential retail and in due course after that hospitality, people can do so confidently. The modalities and the mechanisms, we of course, that all needs to be worked out. Um, and the Prime Minister, I said, will give a, a clearer yeah. sense of the direction of travel. So domestically, it won't be needed, you don't think? A, a domestic vaccine passport where you have to show a bit of paper to go into a supermarket or something like that? Well, it's something that hasn't been ruled out and it's under consideration, but oh. of course you've got to make it workable. And you've got to, I think the thing with, when, when I've looked at this, whether it's on the international, or domestic or the local uh, level, you've got to know that the, the document that, that is being uh, presented is something that you can rely on, that it uh, has an accurate reflection of the status of the individual. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's a foolproof uh, answer uh, in the way that sometimes it's presented, but of course we'll look at all the options. Okay, interesting. Uh, let me ask you a quick one on China. They've banned the BBC from being shown in China. Uh, are you going to be calling in the, the new Chinese ambassador for a meeting without coffee at some stage, or, or are, you, are you planning to uh, perhaps rid the defence supplies of Chinese um, company investment, as some of Conservative MPs are calling for? Well, of course, this was a response to Ofcom, the independent regulator in this country, um, barring CG uh, TN, which uh, is a Chinese broadcaster controlled by the Chinese government. The point we've made but with our international partners is that banning BBC World News uh, from China and, and Hong Kong is another example of China cracking down on media freedom. It's a draconian step to take. And frankly, only tarnishes China in the eyes of the world. Um, we will always stand up for media freedom around the world. Uh, we have an international alliance with the Canadians to do so. Um, and it's something that is uh, part of our values and part of the human rights that we stand up for as the United Kingdom. And very finally, uh, on something that we do know is happening, tomorrow this new hotel quarantine scheme is coming in. Do you know how many people are due to isolate in hotels from tomorrow and what is the advice because i've seen some concern from parents on this what is the advice for unaccompanied children traveling alone from these red countries back into the uk 
Well, in terms of the numbers, that will depend on uh, not just what's uh, booked, but then the people that come through the other end. I mean, ideally, we don't want people travelling at all. Mm. The advice, the travel advice is very clear, but this is a, a, a very specific channel set up so that British nationals and residents returning from one of those 33 high-risk countries, predominantly Africa and South America, can do so safely. Um, so we're confident now. We work through the plans. We've got a, a, a workable um, uh, solution. And in, in relation to unaccompanied children, I think there would need to be bespoke arrangements uh, made. But obviously, uh, we would want uh, to minimise the number of unaccompanied children travelling uh, at this time, particularly with the heightened risks and the and the logistical challenges that we've got even though some of them may be returning for school. I mean, I read in the papers that there's concern from some parents about they've taken their kids to, to this country that is now on the red list. They want to go back, put them into school, and they might have to isolate in a hotel for, for 10 days. That's tough for an unaccompanied child. It's really tough, um, and we understand that. But, of course, what we've got to balance that is uh, against the risk that people come in, uh, including children, uh, with variants of the virus or, or with the virus and the risk that places on everyone else, including um, uh, the other people that would have access to that child if they're going straight back into school. So it is difficult, um, but we want to make sure that they can return home and return to school in a safe and responsible way. The Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, speaking to me a little bit earlier here on Swarbrick on Sunday. Lots to pick out from that interview, not least the idea that domestic vaccine passports are under consideration. In theory, the need to produce a paper to go into a supermarket is being looked at by the government. I haven't decided anything, but the fact that it is being looked at uh, seems to be a world away from what the government was saying even earlier last week. Uh, come to more of your thoughts on that in just a moment. We'll speak to Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, in just a moment too. Tom Swarbrick here, 1047. Eddie Mayer on LBC. Once we are the other side of COVID and whatever it comes, how would Labour reform the NHS? It isn't a case of massive top-level restructures, but rather can the investment at the right level. So well, in investment is spending. Would Labour spend more on the NHS than the Conservatives would? Eddie, I, I think it's really hard for you to ask me to say whether or not I'd be higher or lower than a number that you can't no, tell me. No, I'm asking you to stand by your statements over all these years. You say that Conservatives have been under-investing, and I'm asking you to say... Will you invest more? Eddie Mayer, Monday to Friday from 4pm on LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Morning to you, 10.52 is the time. Standing by for us is Jonathan Ashworth, the Shadow Health Secretary, Labour MP for Leicester South. Uh, welcome to the programme this morning, Mr Ashworth. Thank you for your patience. Um, let me ask you then to start off with about the return uh, of schools in three weeks, we're told. All school, school children back in the classroom on March the 8th. Does Labour welcome this? Yeah, we want to see our children back in school. Uh, of course, schools have been open for key workers throughout the lockdown, and I think we should remember that. Yes, well said. And, th and thank the teachers for, uh, for, for keeping the schools running. Um, I think the key thing for us is, is there a plan to keep schools open once they do reopen? And to do that, I think we need to invest in ventilation and air, air filtration systems. We've got to do more to drive infections down in the community. So I think we need to pay people decent sick pay to isolate themselves. I think we've got to look now at higher grade mask wearing. Germany, Austria, France is recommending higher grade mask wearing from public transport. Again, mm. that helps bring infection rates down. And of course, we've got to make sure that uh, uh, the teachers uh, at some point get the vaccination because last September, uh, within a few weeks, 25,000 teachers were off school related to COVID, yeah. we don't, which obviously disrupts children's learning. So the, obviously the government have rejected early vaccination of teachers, but we're still waiting to hear whether they will vaccinate teachers as a priority cohort well, teachers, when the current cohort is finished. Yes, but teachers may well have been vaccinated uh, because of a, uh, a critical uh, illness that may, they may have or because of age. Um, so they may have been caught up in the first band. They've not been specifically targeted for vaccination, partly because um, of the questions that still arise about transmissibility. And it's the children transmitting it, perhaps asymptomatically back home, that seems to be the real problem. You've got scientists saying that schools are not large centres of community transmission. Well, I mean, Boris Johnson uh, closed the schools because, in his, his words, the schools were vectors of transmission. There is some early data that suggests that transmission... Uh, is impacted by the vaccinations, but we've still got to wait for all the data to come out and to be fully assessed on that front. What we're yes. hoping to see when schools reopen is that they stay open. Now, you're right to say some teachers will fall within the first nine phases of vaccination, which is is being rolled out uh, at the moment. But there's still around... Uh, we don't know the numbers. There's no. I've not, I've not seen any data which tells us how many teachers have long-term conditions, so we'll get vaccination. But we certainly know there's probably around 400,000 teachers who are under 50. Uh, now, obviously, a proportion of them will get vaccination because of condition. Mm. But there's probably a significant proportion of them who won't be in these first nine cohorts, which means they may, may well not get vaccinated until May, June, July, even though yes. the schools are open from March. So I do think it's important the government look at a occupational uh, uh, cohort as, as part of the next phase, phase of vaccination. Yeah. Do you think then in the meantime, as the JCVI um, decides on, on how to prioritise, do you think in the meantime that it would be wise for teachers to wear masks in the classroom, for example? You've talked about the, the apparent need for better masks. Do you think teachers should be wearing them in the classroom? I, I think our mask guidance does need to be reviewed and updated. As I said, Germany, uh, France, Austria are now recommending higher grade mask wearing. Uh, mm. I think we also have to rec look at higher grade PPE as well for, for hospitals, for the staff who are not in ICUs who are working. Because of the worry about variants. Time. Yes, because of the worry about variants yeah. and the increase in, in infectiousness. Now, now, obviously, vaccination does change the landscape, which is a which is a good thing. But even as we're vaccinating and we're, and it's look, we're going to hit the target. And that, that is a good thing. That, congratulations to all involved. But even as, as we hit the targets, there's still millions of people who are not vaccinated, millions of people who have mm. not got natural antibodies. So until we, until we vaccinate more widely across society, uh, we do need to do all we can to suppress this virus. So we need to lock so in you, the vaccination, yeah. vaccination advantage we've built up now by doing more to cut transmission chains. So I would definitely consider that. Obviously, the, 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 as a sort of roundabout way of getting back to your question, apologies. <laughs> Thank you, yes. But I think that, yes, I, I, I would urge the, the relevant scientific bodies, the CMO, the CSA, to urgently review mask wearing. And I think it is something that now has to be considered because other countries are going down that road.
Thank you for that answer. It's nice to have a politician note when they've taken us around the houses on an answer. Um, let me come. Let me come then directly to something that the foreign secretary told me this morning uh, in my interview with him: uh, that the government has not ruled out the possibility of introducing COVID documents, um, so vaccine passports, in effect, both within the UK and, of course, for overseas travel. Do you think it would be? right in principle to have a system of, of people having to show paperwork in order to go into shops, supermarkets, restaurants? Well, I think certainly on the international front, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. And we've already conceded that principle as a, as, a, mm. as a globe because there are certain countries where you have to show a yellow fever certificate, a yellow fever passport to enter. Obviously, that is not, is not on the same scale as COVID. But domestically? But I think certainly in the short term, uh, it, some some uh, organisations are probably going to expect it. So I don't think it should be compulsory, but I think the infrastructure should be put in place so that if you've had a vaccination, then you can have a sort of app on your phone or something like that to prove it. What what I'm worried about is more, this is more related to the summer holidays, that GP surgeries are inundated with requests um, mm. You know, every summer from people saying, you know, I've booked my two weeks in Lanzarote, can you give me a, uh, a a letter confirming I've had the vaccination? That'll just put huge pressure on GPs. So I think it's inevitable that some system needs to be in place. And I would urge the government to look at uh, uh, look at a way in which it can all be recorded on an app on a phone. I'll let you go and enjoy uh, your Valentine's Day and pick up whatever uh, fell off uh, in the in your kitchen over the course of the interview, Mr. Ashworth. It was just the kids trying to get come in the come into the kitchen. That was all. Yeah. Well, poor things. They've probably been cooped up inside trying to wait for you to come on. So I'll let you go. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan Ashworth. You're the Shadow Health Secretary, Labour MP for Leicester East on the programme this morning, um, picking up on what Dominic Raab told us about the government looking at the possibility of domestic uh, vaccine passports. We'll pick up on that a bit later. I want to focus after the news at eleven on this idea of coming back to schools. As a teacher, will you be taking up the advice that the Labour Party is, so or certainly Jonathan Ashworth is asking the scientists to consider to wear a mask in schools? What of the testing that we were told was ready to go by Gavin Williamson, the Education Secretary, back at the start of January? Haven't heard a lot about that over the course of the last few weeks. That is going to need to be in place in order to get schools back, I'd have thought. The idea of them all going back together, both primary and secondary. Uh, we'll speak to the former Education Secretary, Justine Greening, joins us. Swarbrick on Sunday, after the news at 11. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 11 o'clock, the Foreign Secretary has told LBC the government isn't ruling out a coronavirus vaccine passport for people to have access to travel, shop and work. Last week, the Vaccines Minister, Nadim Zahawi, said such documentation is not how Britain operates. But this morning, in another apparent U-turn, Dominic Grab has told Swarbrick on Sunday the idea is still being considered. What we want to do is make sure that there's enough confidence in the national rollout that when we're in a position to open non-essential retail and in due course after that hospitality, people can do so confidently. The modalities and the mechanisms, we of course, that all needs to be worked out. In response, Mark Harper, chair of the COVID Recovery Group and the Conservative MP for the Forest of Dean, has told Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC domestic passports are a bad idea. As far as international travel is concerned, clearly other countries are entitled to have rules about what you have to do before you enter their country. And so clearly if countries require you to have a COVID vaccination, that's entirely up to them. In the UK, I don't think we want to get to a position where we're telling people they can't do things unless they've been vaccinated with COVID. Separately, the ban on bailiff enforced evictions across England is being extended until the end of next month. It was introduced by the government at the start of the COVID pandemic last March to protect private renters. Downing Street says it will remain in place for all but the most serious cases. In other headlines this hour, Donald Trump is hinting he could return to US politics after being acquitted during his second impeachment trial. The former president has been found not guilty of inciting violence at the US Capitol building last month. In a statement, Mr Trump says he has much to share with his supporters to make America great again. But Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi has this reaction to the verdict. What we saw in that Senate was a cowardly group of Republicans who apparently have no options because they were afraid to defend 
defend their job, respect the institution in which they serve. Reports say universities that stifle freedom of speech could be fined. According to the Sunday Telegraph, the Education Secretary will announce new measures this week to strengthen existing legal protections. Labour is warning 2.4 million jobs could be lost over the next three months because of COVID-related debt on business. The party suggests a new recovery agency is set up to manage loans from the government to businesses. A former chief of the European Central Bank has been sworn in as Italy's next Prime Minister. Mario Draghi has formed a unity government made up of the main political parties in the country following the collapse of the previous administration last month. The weather, patchy rain and snow across the north of the UK to be replaced by heavier rain later. Cloudy elsewhere and feeling raw in the southeasterly wind, a high of 6 degrees. From Global's newsroom, I'm Philip Chrysakos. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Just gone 11 o'clock. Very good morning to you. Tom Swarbrick with you this morning here on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday. Happy Valentine's Day if you are celebrating or commiserating. Either way, it's a good excuse to drink, isn't it? It's probably too early. Uh, in a few moments' time, certainly after the news at 12, we'll talk about um, what Dominic Raab was telling us about the government considering the possibility of domestic vaccine passports. This has been something that has previously been ruled out but seems to be on the table up for discussion. As you heard uh, Labour's Jonathan Ashworth saying that he thought to an extent they may well be inevitable because some companies will presumably uh, require um, members of the public to show one before they go into their store or their restaurant or their cafe. So what system is come up with to make that easy? to make it workable, clearly the government is paying some attention to it. We'll come on to that after the news at 12. We'll talk about the economic recovery from coronavirus, how speedy, how big that could be. Uh, we'll speak to the chairman of Resilience first. But I want to start on schools because front page of the Sunday Times, and frankly it has been the date that many, many millions of parents have been looking forward to, uh, school children are set to return to the classroom on March the 8th under plans to start lifting the lockdown. Uh, Boris Johnson is going to set this out in a national address next week, we're told. Under the government's blueprint to reopen society, adults will initially have only small new freedoms so as to prioritise the return of schools, a move ministers know will raise the coronavirus R number for infections. Uh, the paper reports that the decision to reopen both primary and secondary schools goes against the advice of some government scientists, but the Prime Minister was swayed by faster than expected reductions in hospital admissions and infections. Is it right that schools reopen all at once on that date? If you're a teacher in a school, what measures will you be taking to protect yourself even further? We've talked about the possibility of wearing masks in the classroom, for example. 0345 6060973. We'll speak to the General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders in just a moment. But joining me live, Justine Greening, former Education Secretary. Thank you for your time on the programme this morning, uh, Ms Greening. Um, do you think morning, it's sir. right? Thank you. Do you think it's right that schools return altogether on March the 8th? I think we've got to make sure that it's safe. Um, we have to make sure that it fits in with this much wider strategy to try and get schools open, but also the country back on track after coronavirus. Uh, it's very clear that a lot of parents have really struggled over the last several months, but particularly the last several weeks since we came back after Christmas. And I think they are absolutely desperate, really, to see our schools open. We have to do that safely. But I think the key thing really that we all need to be focused on is how we're going to not only help children catch up, not just the learning loss, but their social and emotional development, if you like, that they haven't had a chance to do so much being out of school. But then what we do in the longer term, because levelling up is really at the heart of the government's agenda. And of course, education is at the heart of that. So hmm. it's really important the Prime Minister doesn't just set out the short term steps they're going to be taking, but also the longer term steps for young people to make sure that COVID doesn't damage their future permanently. Yeah. 
Uh, come on to that in just a moment. As you say, that is critical. But when it comes to safety in schools, um, at the moment, it feels like that is largely in the eye of the beholder. Um, what measures do you think need to be introduced or that the edu current education secretary can work with schools on to make it a bit safer? Reducing classroom sizes, uh, rapid testing in schools, the wearing of masks for teachers? Well, I've said for some time we need to look at how staff can stay safe, how students can stay, stay safe and what that means in terms of the space that will be needed for education, but also how you can then not only prevent uh, the virus from spreading, but also then respond quickly when you do mm. find cases. Of so you need an overall approach. I think behind that, there also sits a need to really improve remote learning. A lot of schools have worked incredibly hard on this. But we know that actually the reason that schools need to get back is partly because parents are finding it so hard to do remote learning. So I think the, the challenge has been for ministers that they either needed to optimise the strategy for allowing children to learn safely at school, and I don't think that's happened, or they needed to work much harder on making sure that children who are out of school could keep studying. And I think mm. that's been a challenge as well. And that's really why we're in the situation we now find ourselves. Well, on that point then about, you know, the fact that maybe ministers have, have created a sort of halfway house that doesn't satisfy either of the two points you made. How do you think the current education secretary is doing in his job? I think the entire education team has found it very, very hurt, hard to stay ahead of the curve. I think we've seen children who needed hardware and laptops and data still not able to get it. I think what matters now actually is almost less a diagnosis of what's gone on over the last year and more a coming together between teachers. You're about to hear from Jeff Barton, someone who, who I have a huge amount of respect for, um, teachers, um, Westminster uh, and and you know leaders, school leaders on the ground, and parents mm. to get a collective plan at how we can get schools open, but how we can then have a much longer term approach to help help young people catch up. Well, let me ask you then on that on that longer term approach, uh, Professor Robert Dingwall, uh, Professor of Sociology on Nerve Tag, saying uh, earlier this morning that the idea of sending kids back into school to to cram for the exams or to go back to the way learning was done before is really going to miss the mark um, because children will need to be uh, re-engaged with how to learn. I wonder if you share that assessment. I think we do need to take a fresh assessment of not only what young people are learning in school but then how we help them get back on track it's not just learning loss it's the fact that they haven't been socializing with their friends they haven't been able to do team sports and all of those other activities that happen at school that help you develop as a person and you need a plan for all of it not just the learning loss and the catch-up czar sir kevin collins uh, another a really strong person, I think, to be able to help pull together plans. He's made that very, very point. I've been saying for some time we need to look at what we do with exams in the summer in relation to how broad the curriculum can be. Um, and if we're being, we're testing children, if you like, like on coursework, how you do that fairly. All mm. of this needs to be really carefully thought through. And I think for a lot of young people who are very uncertain about what will happen when they get to the summer and when they normally have had exams, and they're really worried about the fact this might damage their long-term future, the sooner there can, there can be a bolted down plan that is really clear for them, I think the better, because in a sense, it's not just what we're putting in place, it's how we do it to give that reassurance to students and parents that actually there is now a proper plan going to be put in place. Very good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Justine Greening, you were the Education Secretary between 2016 and 2018. Listening to that is Jeff Barton, who is the General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders. Thank you for joining the programme this morning, Mr Barton. The suggestion then is that they all go back on March the 8th. Is that safe, sir? Uh, it's a good question, but is, is that what's being proposed? I know we've got the Sunday Times headlines, but you know, I, I listened, as other people listened, to the Prime Minister a few weeks back, and for me, an English teacher by background, the key word was from rather than on. And I think what that does is to give a certain amount of wriggle room based on the science as to whether it is the case that all young people of all ages in all institutions are going mm. back, or whether it is some in some institutions with some ages. And I think the planning that's going on is essentially looking at what different scenarios there might be. And I think the last thing ah. we want is to look back and to think, that the revolving door of education has suddenly slammed shut again because too much was done too quickly.
So you're, I, I don't know how much, I, I presume you've been speaking to the Department for Education over the course of the last few weeks, so they ought to be speaking to someone, um, in coming up with a plan. Is your understanding that actually the schools will go back gradually as opposed to all at once? Well, I think what we will hear a week tomorrow is an announcement as to whether it is that. And we, we all know that there's a kind of ebullient optimism from the Prime Minister. I hope that doesn't get in the way of doing something more gradually if that's what the scientists are saying. And ultimately, you know, people like me are educationists. What we want to talk about is how do we do the learning recovery for young people? We're reliant on the scientists. And even this morning, listening to you, you can see that you've got various different opinions from yes. different eminent scientists around all of this. And I would just think that most of the public would understand if we had to have a phased response, which means that some young people of some ages may be different in certain regions, I, I would have thought people would think that's probably sensible if it means we can get more young people in for the longer term. Well, as you say, you've got this uh, a, a difference of opinion amongst the scientific community, whether it's Professor Robert Dingwall, as you say, speaking to me a bit earlier, talking about the, uh, the Prime Minister taking a more conservative position than is necessary on the reopening of schools, saying that schools could perhaps be opened at the end of half term. Uh, you've got the Deputy CMO, J uh, Dr Jenny Harries, saying that schools are not sources of large community transmission, that they are safe. Exactly, and that, that totally exemplifies it. And in a way, the word safe has been a distraction, hasn't it? Because this was never really so much about whether those young people... But why, gra why do we need to do it gradually? I mean, I understand the need for care, but if it, they are considered by the scientists to be safe and the R rate is falling and hospitalisations are down and uh, people aren't dying in the huge, uh, terrifying numbers that we have been seeing, let's get them all back. Kids can't wait. No, I, th I think you know somebody who, who is an educationist. We want young people in school, but we also know, and again, it's not my expertise, but we know from listening to scientists that all of this was about stopping the community transmission. And we know that those young people, particularly the older ones, the secondary ones, were transmitters of that. Now, if, if it's the case that scientists are going to say a week tomorrow, actually, exactly as you've just outlined it, all young people on the same day can be back in schools. And we know that the R rate is going to increase, but actually the problem with that is not as great as we thought. Well, then convince us of that, and that's yeah. exactly what we will do. But uh, you can see why I wouldn't, as an educationist, think it's my responsibility to do anything other than help with the planning and looking at the sure. scenarios if the science says it can't be all or nothing. Well, let me ask you then about testing, just finally, because... Um I swear I remember the Education Secretary saying in January that mass testing for schools was ready to go. The regulator then decided that the tests were not ready and said that they couldn't be used. What do you understand the position to be when it comes to testing, mass testing, quick testing in schools? Well, you're absolutely right. It was actually the day before Christmas Eve that we had this announcement that uh, schools were going to be turned into uh, essentially MASH-style field hospitals and we were going to recruit an army of people to, to do the testing. That appears, from where I am, to have disappeared. Now, partly it's disappeared for the reasons that you've talked about, that actually there were questions around the efficacy of those tests. There were also big questions, which we would say, about the logistics of all of that, because even though they're described as quick tests, if you're running a college of, let's say, 2,000 young people and you're being expected to test all of those 2,000 before they go into the classroom and each one of those takes half an hour, you can see that what that then does is to make the actual learning, the education, much yeah. more difficult because you're doing the testing. I think we will see a change of plan on all of that. I think there will be some routine mass testing. I don't think it'll be on the scale that was being announced. Um, and I think most of us would say, good, that allows educationists to focus on the most important thing, teaching and learning. But of course, uh, may well uh, have an effect on on the safety aspect. Jeff, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Jeff Thanks. Barton, General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders. Uh, it's a date that has been in the diary in our house for some time, but when schools can go back, if I'm honest with you. Uh, and the idea that all schools will go back on the March the 8th feels like a lovely idea. The reality, if there isn't the possibility of doing mass quick testing in schools, uh, if not all teachers have received a vaccine, although to be honest with you, I think that that, that is a secondary issue, issue to the testing in schools. The chances of all of them going back on the same day, I think that would be too quick, don't you? 0345 6060 973. If you're a teacher listening to this, how do you feel about being told to go back into the classroom, even if you do not believe it is safe? Will there be some uh, teaching unions who say, actually, we don't think it's safe enough for our teachers and therefore we're advising them maybe to stick with the online learning for a bit? 0345 6060 973 is the number. Your call's in just a mo. Tom Swarbrick here, 1116. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Morning to you. We'll talk about the economic recovery, or so-called, or the, hopefully the start of one, uh, in just a few moments' time. But let's get your calls on schools on the radio. Jack's a new caller in Clandudnod, Wales. I think that's in northern <laughs> Wales, isn't it, Jack? Did I get it right? Was that close? Um, no, it, it was close. Um, it's in mid-Wales, but, uh, but okay. I appreciate the attempt anyway. Um, Thanks. I yeah. tried. Um, the, I think, personally sending kids back to school right now is a really bad idea. Like, how even the talks that they're trying to possibly alleviate lockdown in March is also a bad idea. It's 12 months too early. We need to wait until everybody's been vaccinated. But also the other you're thing... You're joking. About, you are joking. Sorry. You're joking in mid-Wales, aren't you? We need to wait a no, year. Uh, yes, because we got... If I, I, like, if, when I checked my time to get vaccinated, vaccinated it was going to be about September time. Like, I'm going to have How old are you, Jack? To be vaccinated. I'm 22. What is your risk of being hospitalised by coronavirus? Um, hi, I'm a delivery driver. I deliver parcels around um, all uh, around Wales at the moment. Well, now, hang I'm on a sec. Hang on, Jack. I, I'm very good for, for doing what you're doing in this time, but your risk of catching it might be higher than others, certainly if you're staying home, but your risk of going into hospital as a, as a young person who doesn't have any underlying health conditions, I'm, I'm assuming... Um, it's very low, incredibly low. It's not, it's not completely gone, but it is very, very low. The of idea course, that I, we would I, lock I, down... I, yeah. Hang on a sec. The idea that we would lock yeah. down an entire nation because there exists the possibility of you going into hospital is not a justification, sir. I understand that. But what I'm basically meaning is that the reason we are in the situation that we are, personally, from what I've seen, it, is that the government hasn't taken this pandemic completely seriously at the very start. Like, if you look at New Zealand, for example, as soon as COVID started going around those areas, they put the lockdown straight down. They were like, right, Agreed. we are locking everything down, and so on. While, totally with the government, while government here, they took their time, they didn't really take it seriously, and then they put it in way too late. I couldn't um, agree with you more, but I don't know how... I mean, we can go back over that if you like, but that doesn't really help us in determining when we come out of this. You cannot keep people locked down in this fashion once 99% of the death risk, 88% of the hospitalisation risk has been vaccinated. Yeah, um, it's a fair point. But it's like, for me personally, I, it's like we've, I've already, we've already come out of a lockdown once, way too early. And if we then go back into another lockdown, I don't want to come out yep. of a lockdown now for us to go back into another lockdown in the summer. The I could not agree with you more. Is, the other problem is also is the fact that the, it's like the government allowed uni students to go back to uni. That was the other reason why the thing is like why the COVID cases spiked up mm. again, because they said uni students go back to uni. Why did they do that? Because they need <laughs> because the unis needed the money. Um, and the government doesn't want to subsidise those people. Yeah. And well, listen, Jack, I think... I think you're. I think you're. You're right about the your diagnosis of the problems that led to lockdown having to be reimposed. I guess the difference is now that we've got the vaccine and the vaccination program is seemingly working very well. But I would ag agree with your uh, abundance of caution that is necessary to get us out of this carefully, so that we'd never have to do this ever again. But the idea of waiting a year, I'm afraid, is just not going to happen. People won't won't live their lives like that. Thank you for your call. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number. More in just a moment. Eleven twenty three. Let's turn though to the economic recovery from coronavirus, or uh, what's being described as the possibility of a quick economic recovery. Uh, the uh, Bank of England chief has said the economy, although expected to shrink four point two percent in the first three months of 2021 will nevertheless bounce back strongly this year as a result in part of the vaccination program let's turn to simon collins who is the chairman of resilience first and the former chairman of kpmg uk thank you very much for joining us on the program uh, this morning mr collins what's your assessment of, of the optimism coming out of uh, the old lady of threadneedle street this week Morning, Tom. I think there's reason for optimism. If you look at uh, last year, 2020, GDP shrank nearly 10%, which is a horrifying headline. If you look within that, though, in the in quarter three, when there was a bit of a release from lockdown, actually it rose very sharply, almost 16%. So that gives you an idea of the sort of agility and the springboard effect that, that can happen. And I think if, I, if I'm looking for a glass half full, we've got vaccine success. Um, people want to get back to work. They want to get out again, grab coffees, party, travel, uh, in short, spend money. And that's, I think, going to be fuelled by cheap credit, pent-up savings, um, and a lot of liquidity in institutions. So sentiment feels like uh, you know, it could bounce back positively. 
Yes, I wonder about that sentiment. That I, I saw some figures produced by uh, the Bank of England in the week which talked about the additional savings that households had made because they hadn't been spending the money that they would normally spend. Is your view, um, and if so, where are you getting their view from, that people are going to go out and spend that money quite quickly because demand is so pent up? Well, the, the view is anecdotal, but I think there is a feeling that uh, people look. There's, there's, there's two very distinct effects of COVID. There's a lot of people suffering very badly and very short of, of money, um, but there are people who've continued in work or been beneficiaries of furlough and other schemes. So I think you've got two speeds there. Um, but but figures I've seen and certainly anecdotal evidence is that there are people wanting to book. Uh, you know, holidays, get back to eating out, do those sort of things. So the answer is we'll wait and see. Yeah. Uh, and there are some obstacles. You know, we, we've got quite a lot of the economy being propped up by things like furlough, stamp duty, um, exemptions and so on. And when that safety net is is hopefully progressively pulled back, uh, it, it's going to expose that. But but I think net, there's still, uh, still optimism. Um, as, as an organisation that looks at helping business be resilient, I mean, this, this has tested the resilience of business uh, in unimaginable ways. Um, what do you think is going to change in the day-to-day, uh, month-to-month running of uh, restaurants, cafes, whatever it is, certainly in the hospitality sector, to make them more resilient were we ever to have to do anything like this again? I think one one of the things, it's funny, there's so many long-term things colliding at the same time. We've got uh, COVID, which has made people look at their business models, how quickly they can shut things down, open them up again, work from home. And I think British industry yeah. has been magnificent in its response to that. Uh, that's going on at the same time as Brexit, which is forcing people to look at their supply chain resilience. You know, can they get alternative supplies and things? And then there's some other incredible long-term trends. And you couldn't make up that these are all happening together. You've got decarbonisation. Yeah, you know, sort of COP twenty one coming, uh, twenty six coming. Sorry, and you've also got the, the whole fourth industrial revolution thing of, of um, artificial intelligence and automation. Uh, you know, any one of those things would cause businesses to have to look at their models and their resilience carefully. But the more colliding is extraordinary. Um, but what I think we have seen, just take the examples of businesses working from home, making sure they can get supplies through. Uh, I think the response of industry has been fantastic, and, and that I think is part of the reason for optimism about navigating um, you know, however bumpy it is ahead. You, you lay out the challenges very well. I, I just wonder then if you think that the old ways of doing things like people driving to a town centre, paying for parking, walking up and down the local high street, that's gone now, that's over. I, I think it's over at the levels we saw it before. There, there's a, a huge debate. Uh, you know, I could hardly have a conversation in boardrooms or in, in sort of with, with business people without talking about to what extent this working from home is a new normal. Um, yeah. A very, a very crude and untested assumption I would I would give you is that people are talking about you know a long term recovery to around sixty percent, seventy percent, crudely of uh, you know working back in offices or doing things. So it, it won't be a recovery back to twenty nineteen levels, but there will be some recovery because you know, human beings like interactions, they like uh, you know working. So uh, a long, slow recovery back to a lesser degree of normal, mm. uh, with some bumpy and jagged paths to. It, I think. Yes. Uh, well, it'd be interesting to see how much that trend for working from home does last. Um, just while I've got you, Mr. Collins, uh, I realise it's your old place of work as the former chairman of KPMG, but the company is in the news or has been in the news this week. Uh, the boss has resigned, current boss resigned, as a result of uh, uh, perhaps the use of language on a Zoom call with, with members of staff, telling them not to, not to complain about uh, the impact of the pandemic on them and other elements. I wonder what you made of it, make of it watching it from afar. I think, Tom, all I'd say about that is KPMG is a, is a firm that, that's always, uh, including under Bill's leadership, cared enormously about looking after people and about being responsible citizens. And I know that the, you know, the firm's bigger than leaders and I know the firm will continue to do that going forward. Very good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Simon Collins, you're the chairman of Resilience First and the former chairman of KPMG UK, Resilient First, a not-for-profit membership organisation trying to improve the resiliences of uh, resilience of business in the UK and beyond. Uh, let's come to your calls. Phil's in Sidcup before the news at 11.30 on getting schools back up and running. Hi there, Phil. Hi, Tom. Your I, thoughts? I want to take, um, again, about what you say. Um, sorry about this, but I just think that you need to get over this, that all children are a homogenous blob. And 
I don't know what your circumstances are, but you're younger than me, with younger children. Um, I've got 16, 18 year old, and as far as I'm concerned, they're two adults. Um, I'm 52, so potentially vulnerable. So to say that our situations are analogous is is reasonable, really. I agree. So the whole no, no, thing around, I, so thing around the 8th of March being some sort of um, this is this is what I don't like about the government. It's, it keeps setting dates to appease to a certain um, selection of people. Um, and there seems to be this sort of um, bandwagon that follows on, you know, that we're getting the, the papers follow that as well. And I just think that it has to be common sense applied. And what, I mean, you, you talk about your children and, and you're chomping it a bit to get them back. Ours have been doing fine. I mean, it's uh, it's not, you know, uh, a cookie cutter sort of approach, really. There's, you know, it's... Uh, does it make sense, sort of thing? And Phil, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I really sorry, couldn't agree sorry, with you. I, I, thought you were, I thought you were like this, you know, championing the, the whole get Oh, I am. Oh, I, yeah. I absolutely am. But but I I the the line for me is um, we can never do this again. We can never be in a position where we have to lock down the country in this way for this long ever again. And so to avoid that, obviously the vaccination program helps. But we should be very cautious about how schools go back because the government seems to admit that the R rate will go up once schools do. Uh, and I would suggest, Phil, that if your two are coping fine and they're doing OK and you think that you can manage it and they can manage it, then the requirement to get them back into school is much uh, less great than, say, I think for the, for the primary end of the spectrum, where working from home and homeschooling is nigh on impossible, uh, and where it seems like transmission of coronavirus is, is the numbers suggest, uh, it happens much less at a primary age than perhaps at a secondary age. Sure. I mean, that, that's the thing. We work from home, so the vector for us would be the, the school, as opposed to yeah. maybe people that are going out to work and, and, and wanting, you know, need to get the children back. Uh, we are all at home schooling from home and, and work from home. So so we seem to be coping well. So the, the applying this sort of, you know, broad brush, generalised thing, hopefully that it won't be the case. I'm not, I, look, I want to I get them back and they want to they be able to see their friends. I, I, you know, that's that's undoubtedly the case sort of thing. But there has to be sort of a, a, a staged approach and maybe, yep. you know, on a per case per case basis. I don't know, but hopefully we'll, we'll, that will come out. But also just quickly, on the, if you don't mind, just on Mark Harper and... Um, and uh, uh, passports. Maybe he needs some introspection because if the UK were doing so well in their managing of it, then maybe we wouldn't need to have um, these passports. But really, on the way we've managed it so far, maybe that we may need to do that. So uh, that's all. What, but in that. domestically as well, you think you think within oh, no, the country? I'm, not, I, I'm just saying that Mark Harper sort of the, the, again one of the, the CRG is spousing this sort of freedom loving approach. If we'd done really well in our managing of it, I could be I, you know I could probably you know. Not not along sagely to his sort of recommendation that we don't do it, but because we've done everything mm. poorly up until this point, maybe we need to have that. I don't know. Do you know, Phil? But, it's but, it's it's really yeah, it's really interesting you bring that up actually. Um, and uh, feathers have been ruffled by the foreign secretary's suggestion on this program earlier that the government is l considering the possibility of bringing in domestic vaccine passports. Um, uh, and I, to be honest with you, uh, what stops a private business saying to uh, would-be patrons, I'm afraid you can't come in unless you can show that you've had a vaccine because we don't want to run the risk of, of bringing COVID in or spreading it around. What stops a company from doing that? And if companies are able to do that, is it not right that the government looks at what might be possible and what might be needed, what might be workable to ensure that that happens and doesn't happen in an unfairly discriminatory way? So I sort of, I, to an extent, I, I agree with, with Tony Blair in saying that they're probably inevitable, aren't they? Even domestically, which feels a horrific way of living our lives to have to, you know, produce a bit of paper to go in the supermarket. But if the supermarket is going to demand it anyway, doesn't there need to be a scheme looked at to make sure it's workable? 0345 6060 973 is the number. Phil, thank you very much. We'll come to more of your calls after this. Tom Swarbrick here, 1133. News headlines now. Philip Krisikos. The Foreign Secretary says ministers are considering COVID vaccine passports for use here and abroad. Dominic Raab has refused to rule them out on Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. Their use domestically would be in places including supermarkets and pubs across the UK. Separately, a group of Conservative MPs have written to Boris Johnson to commit to a timetable for lifting coronavirus restrictions across England with a complete end to controls by the end of April. The COVID recovery group insists the tremendous pace of the vaccination rollout means there's no reason 
reason why restrictions should continue beyond then. One other headline this half hour, US President Joe Biden says democracy is fragile after his predecessor was found not guilty in his impeachment trial. Donald Trump has been acquitted of inciting violence at the US Capitol building last month after Democrats failed to reach the two-thirds majority to secure a conviction. The weather, patchy rain and snow across the north of the UK, ahead of heavier rain to come later this afternoon. Cloudy elsewhere, feeling raw in the southeasterly wind, a high of six degrees. This is LBC. This is LBC, Swarbrick on Sunday, with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. It does seem to be the case that the government really wants to get all schools, both primary and secondary, reopened on March the 8th. Now, that is, of course, great if you can do it safely, but... All schools together in one, you know, imagine the buses of school kids trying to get to, into through the gates and the classes that are going to be filling up on March. It just feels a little too soon for that, doesn't it? Uh, Maria's a new caller in South End. Hi, Maria. Um, hello, good morning, Tom. Hi, um, hi. I've, um, this is a first time caller, <laughs> a little bit nervous. You're more than welcome. Um, Please just, don't be nervous. <laughs> thank you. Um, just as first of all, to just say that um, I think all school teachers are absolutely dying to get the children back to school because we, it's very, very difficult with virtual learning and the virtual teaching. Um, I have to go to school every day, which is absolutely fine because my Wi-Fi isn't great, but I find it easier to um, teach off two screens. Um, mm. I'm a science teacher, so I... Uh, the chemistry in particular the experiments yes and so to get the kids back through the gates 
question is, I'm 63 years in uh, April, and I'm a little bit nervous about all the children coming back, and mm. um, I haven't had a vaccination. Now, I'm in Group mm. 7 because I'm just, not that it's, <laughs> not it's a bad thing, but I'm just the wrong side of 65. And so on that basis, I'm, I'm, I'm not high priority in terms of having the vaccine. I'm just putting no. it to you that maybe um, there could be um, a sort of a provision for people like me, school teachers that may be over 50, to be prioritised for the vaccine before March the 8th um, so that we feel more comfortable about being surrounded by an awful lot of people when we've been mm. surrounded by hardly any people at all. I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Well, listen, I think I can, absolutely I see the the logic of it and sympathise, uh, Maria, with, with the position that you're going to find yourself in and lots of people will be worrying about that. As you say, if you're in, if you're in Group 7, in theory from tomorrow, you should be getting called or, or having to call people to say, um, I'm, I'm here, I want to be vaccinated as they move through the rest of the groups now that one to four seem to have been done in double quick s speed. So that that will help. Yeah. Um, so, but I realise that that's m the, the efficacy you would get from that won't kick in until after March the 8th anyway. No. Um, so, and, and the logic is that, and again, this, this is, it splits scientific opinion, this, whether schools really are centres of spread. Um, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Jenny Harries, doesn't seem to think they are. The only thing with schools is um, I'm in um, a large secondary school. Um, we've got over 100 teachers, um, obviously all mm. of which are adults. We've got an, a lot of support staff uh, for our special education needs students. Um, we've got a lot of admin staff. We've got a lot of people working in catering, um, producing huge amounts of lunches, etc., etc. Um, we've got caretaking staff. It's not just teachers. A school is not a place just for no, agreed. teachers. Agreed. So I will not just be with the children, which is one thing. I will be with uh, with about two hundred and over two hundred actual adults as well, where I mm. haven't been with probably more than four adults for ages. Mm. What would you say, Maria? And I realise that this is uh, this even putting this to you apparently lacks the necessary th sympathy required for someone in your position. So apologies for that in advance. But the damage being done to young people by not being in school is so great that it outweighs any potential damage that could be done to you if you were to catch it and fall ill, given yeah. the balance of risks between the two. That your risk of ending up in hospital is higher than a twenty-something teacher's, but not so high as to mean that schools should continue to be shut or that they should wait until you been vaccinated yes I, I agree i agree with you however the um the, the average age of people at the moment in itu uh, intensive therapy um is 60 and so if mm. i do contract it i'm then i uh, you are there at greater is a greater risk. higher likelihood yeah. that I'm going to be ending up in IC, uh, intensive care. Well, I do. I, I don't and I think do... there's that also, Tom. I don't think that's that Sorry. many teachers that are of my age who are um, uh, who are working, and yeah. I don't think there's that many of us in in my school. There's only two people over sixty out of well, all listen, those Maria, teachers. I think I, it's only two. I, I actually I actually think you encapsulate... Thank you for your call, by the way, and great first-time call. You no need to be nervous at all. I actually think you encapsulate part of the reality of getting schools back up and running, which is, for some people, you might take a decision that in order to be right on the safe side, you'll continue to do a bit of teaching from home if you can, or you'll continue to do your classes slightly... Or so something will be done slightly differently for someone in your position to mean that once you've been vaccinated, then you can get back out and running again uh, with the afterburners on. Maria, thank you very much indeed. Tom's in Manchester. Hi there, Tom. Hi there. Uh, again, Hello. this time, Carla, so uh, I can feel the trepidation as well. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So, yeah, I work in uh, a primary school in, in Manchester. I'm a teaching assistant. Uh, hmm. uh, but at the moment, I'm currently leading... Uh, my own small bubble of children. Uh, I'm, I'm in a three form entry school, so there's three classes per year group. Uh, two of the, uh, one of the teachers has their own bubble at the moment, and then I've got my own bubble. The other two teachers are sorting out the remote learning. Now, you'd think uh, you'd think those two teachers would therefore have less work, but 
I've I've never known them to be so inundated mm. with the level of work that got at the moment, uh, and it's just um, it's just really really difficult to kind of think of. Uh, to think about the kind of positions that they're in at the moment, but um, uh, what I, what I wanted to say really was um, even like like despite the fact that um, I can understand why why a lot of schools aren't open at the moment because it's looking after the children and the staff. Yeah. We uh, uh, we've had a few uh, breakouts among the staff yeah. in terms of COVID, and I can understand that, but. When you're actually in the classroom and you can see the impact that it is having on the children that actually are in school as well, not just the academic impact, but also the social and emotional impact. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just, it's trying to cope with the little things like, <laughs> um, you know, friendships, arguments with friends, but yeah. also yeah. like, but like some of the important things like learning how to cope with failure and mistakes. And and the amount of time that they've ha- had off now, it's coming on to eight months of missed learning time within the it's classroom. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable, yeah. Tom. I, I mean, I know I keep referring back to my own children, but, you know, they're my own children. Um, they've missed... So, he has missed so much school. I mean, his first two years of his uh, school life have basically been decimated by this. And so to have to start again and do it quite gradually is is uh, something that you and your colleagues have trained for and that we hand them over to you uh, with the best of intentions so that you can be able to do that, Tom. Listen, great first-time call. Absolutely no need to be nervous. Follow in Tom's shoes and give us a ring if you've not done before. 0345 973 is the number. Uh, we'll come to more of your calls on the reopening of schools. We'll talk to you about the vaccination rollout, but this time when it comes to the rollout uh, for people with learning disabilities, uh, we've got an exclusive story on that. And then after 12, I want to talk about vaccine passports domestically. The Foreign Secretary has slightly opened uh, a can of worms on LBC this morning. Um, we'll, we'll dive into that can in a few moments' time. Tom Swarbrick here, 11.46. Weekends at LBC with Rachel Johnson. My hopes for next year without vaccine passports have telescoped to sitting on a park bench with a friend, having a cup of coffee and not getting arrested. I can't wait for my corona digital pass. I resent being told by a government minister this is not how we do things in this country when, frankly, everything that we used to do as a matter of course has been made illegal. Rachel Johnson, this evening from 7, LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Morning to you. We're, of course, talking about what it is the vaccine rollout allows us to do, given its success in the rollout to the top groups. However, LBC has uncovered that the vaccination rollout to people with learning disabilities in the UK is a bit of a postcode lottery. There have been urgent calls for Matt Hancock to step in to change the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation priority lists amid fears that it's leading to some vulnerable people getting a vaccine in one area with people left waiting in another. Our reporter, Peter Gillibrand, has been personally affected by this, so decided to look into what the reality is for people with learning disabilities. Tom, people with a learning disability are six times more likely to die from coronavirus than the general population. For adults between 18 to 34, that then jumps up to 30 times more likely to lose their lives. Kevin's brother Nigel had brain damage and was 60 years old when he lost his life to the virus back in April. He just thought it was a cough that was going to go away and he was irritated by it. And then he just just increasingly got got worse. Um, And it was about a week after that that he went uh, into hospital. Um, And he, he died within five days. But despite the risks, there isn't any uniform guidance on when this vulnerable group of people should get their vaccine. It's become a postcode lottery, with campaigners telling me they see it as blatant discrimination. 36-year-old Emma from Liverpool has a learning disability and cerebral palsy and was told by her doctors she wouldn't be getting priority access to the vaccine. Everyone feels left out, so my mates, they're getting upset as well. If you speak to them, they they would get upset. Some people have had it and some people haven't. On the other side of the country, I spoke to Joe Fisher from West Sussex, who had to fight for her 27-year-old son, who's in a care home, to get the vaccine. Uh, the journey to the vaccine has been really, really stressful, really stressful, because you you see the news, you watch... And you hear all these people are dying and you think, and they're in care homes and you think, my God, my son's in a care home. When's he going to get his? And why are they not talking about young people in care homes? It's all about older people. So as it stands, only older people with a learning disability and those with Down syndrome are in the top four priority groups. So they should have been offered a vaccine by tomorrow. Then we find severe and profound learning disabilities down in category six. But Learning Disability England say individual GPs aren't consistent on this guidance. It basically means it's been left down to the local healthcare professionals to determine whether someone with a learning disability should have the vaccine or not. Baroness Hollins, who's fighting in the Lords to change the prioritisation list, says it's really bad practice for the JCVI to use those terms. What does it mean? You know, it's a very old fashioned classification, severe and profound. Um, it was originally mild, moderate, severe, profound. It was all based on IQ tests, which don't quite have the same meaning uh, <laughs> today. There are even people in care homes with complex needs who are still waiting for a vaccine. Even more worrying for families is that those with a mild or moderate learning disability aren't on the priority list at all, even though they made up 65% of all learning disabled deaths from COVID in the first wave. Then there's the fact that where you live in the country changes your chances of being eligible for a vaccine. Some health authorities like Kent and Medway are now going to give all people with a learning disability a priority vaccine. So this has led to some confusion, really, about where people with a learning disability, if at all in some cases, slot into the prioritisation list. Adele Harris is the head of the learning disabilities and autism charity MENCAP. If the um, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation just came out immediately and said all people with a learning disability should be in at least priority group six, then all of this um, communication uh, challenge and focusing on definitions and leaving things to the discretion of a a local GP, all of that would just be taken away instantly. LBC understands legal proceedings have even been launched against the Health Secretary Matt Hancock on this. Elizabeth Cleaver is from Bindman LLP and says they're arguing people with a learning disability are being discriminated against. 
really, we, we don't accept the Secretary of State's response when they say that it's we had to accept what the JCVI have said. Um, that, that's not the case. Secretary of State does need to consider other evidence uh, as well. And we just feel that there is evidence that the Secretary of State didn't take a sufficient account of. The Department for Health and Social Care says they can't comment on any potential legal proceedings, but they have told me the JCVI have looked at extensive data on COVID deaths, including people with a learning difficulty. LBC reporter Peter Gillibrand with a really important story there, speaking to those affected by a postcode lottery when it comes to the vaccination rollout, uh, specifically for those with learning disabilities. Uh, 11.56 is the time. Let's come back to your calls on schools. Steve is in Marlborough in Wiltshire. Hi there, Steve. Hi, Tom. Um, I'd just like to say to people, don't panic about your children being off school. Um, just, just calm down, because um, I had an organ transplant uh, 10 years ago, kidney, and since then I've worked with young adults, um, supporting them, mentoring them, that have had or needed organ transplants. Mm. Some of these kids have been in hospital from the age of three mm. until 14, 15, missed huge amounts of school, um, we help mentor them and develop them in their early adult years and are some of the best well-rounded individuals I've ever met. Mm. And you're talking about them missing at least 50% of their school life. Children are very adaptable. Children are very adaptable. Don't panic. Listen, Steve, it's, it's terrific work that you're doing to help those kids in that situation, heartbreaking situation. Um, it is, though, I think, if we're talking about on a national level with every uh, child's education affected in the way that it is, it's only right, I think, that once it becomes possible to get the schools reopened, they do it as quickly as they can, no? Yes, but we keep going on about vaccinating teachers. I've also I'm involved with the charity. I'm involved with one of my best friends in the charity, a virologist. But people spectacularly miss the point. When kids go back to school, it's them spreading it. And whether or not a teacher is vaccinated, it is good for the teacher, and the teacher won't catch it. But that won't stop the spread among totally the right. children and Which their is, families. That's you, where the complete- danger is, Tom. Completely right, which is why, as I said at the start of this, I think testing is actually more critical to the reop- safe reopening of schools than the vaccination right now. Steve, thank you. I want to get Debbie in Stoke on Trent on the radio before midday. Hi there, Debbie. Hi, Tom. Hello. 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 Okay, what I want to say is I just think schools need to get back ASAP. I've um, got two friends, they're both male actually, bringing up teenage sons. Um, these kids are at home working, they are lucky, they've got computers, they've got all the facilities they need. One of them is their dad is home all day with him, yet I have gradually watched both of those boys become more and more withdrawn, insular. One mm. sat down last one night last week and just said, my mental health feels bad, I feel really depressed. Um, that ensued, then I got a phone call in with school to help his dad out, and um, school took him back in as a key worker because his dad's in construction. He was in school Thursday and Friday. The difference in him is unbelievable. Yeah, I think that's right. Just to see his friends, and I think uh, the other things. I mean, why why are teachers any different? And I would say shop workers are a bit more of a risk because I part time work in a, a little local co- uh, co-op. We get elderly people come in, they're offering you handfuls of change. They want you to take it out of their mm. hands because they can't see. I'm not going to say no. Um, and you, you come into contact with way more people than you are doing as a teacher at the front of a classroom. I think that's right. Debbie, listen, I think that's right. I can see, I absolutely sympathise with teachers who feel at risk by going back into school and therefore would want to be vaccinated as soon as possible. I, I completely get that, but it has to be on clinical need first, I think. Thank you so much for your call. Listen, I do want to move on. After the news at midday, we'll get into what it is Dominic Raab told this programme a little earlier, that the government is, despite having ruled it out several times, even as recently Recently as last week, the government is looking at proposals to bring in domestic COVID passports. We've talked about the need for them if you want to travel overseas. Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, confirming that they are looking at potentially what could be done to bring them in when in the UK. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. 
From Global's newsroom at 12 o'clock, Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has told LBC the government isn't ruling out a coronavirus vaccine passport for people to have access to travel, shop and work. The government is already considering if people should have them if they travel abroad to show they've had an inoculation. Shadow House Secretary Labour's Jonathan Ashworth has told Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC he's open to the idea. I don't think it should be compulsory, but I think the infrastructure should be put in place so that if you've had a vaccination, then you can have a sort of app on your phone or something like that to prove it. So I think it's inevitable that some system needs to be in place. And I would urge the government to look at a way in which it can all be recorded on an app on a phone. Separately, a ban on bailiffs evicting renters in England is being extended until the end of next month to try to help people struggling financially because of the pandemic. It was supposed to end a week tomorrow. In other headlines this hour, Donald Trump is welcoming his second impeachment acquittal after Democrats failed to reach two-thirds majority needed to secure a conviction. The former US president had been charged with incitement of insurrection over last month's riots in Washington, D.C. Reports say universities that stifle freedom of speech could be fined. The Sunday Telegraph reports the Education Secretary will announce new measures this week to strengthen existing legal protections. Lord Peter Lilly has told LBC academia needs to stop controlling the past. There is this ideology which is built up within academia of uh, critical race theory, which is essentially a sort of a mutant form of uh, left-wing Marxism, which seeks to control the present by destroying the past or controlling our messages about the past. It seems a far-fetched, but it's got an incredible grip within parts of academia. A group of MPs is urging the government to ban China from making equipment for Britain's armed forces. The Defence Subcommittee says the use of overseas firms in the UK supply chain leaves it open to what it claims is hostile foreign involvement. Tobias Elwood is chair of the Defence Select Committee. He's told LBC he has his own reasons to be cautious about China. It doesn't follow you. WTO rules. It doesn't uh, operate its own country in the same way that we do ours with a Uyghur population. We've seen that. And when it comes to doing business, there's also a huge concern about intellectual property theft, of stealing data, stealing ideas and so forth. And when it comes to our defence and to our aerospace industries, this is absolutely critical. Boris Johnson will urge world leaders this week to work together to defeat what he says will be the common foe of coronavirus. The Prime Minister will host his first virtual meeting of the UK President of the G7 on Friday. Weather forecasters say freezing rain, treacherous ice and 80 mile per hour gusts will mark the end of the UK's cold snap with milder weather forecast from tomorrow. The Met Office says the winds will affect western Scotland and the east coast of Northern Ireland until midnight. The weather for this afternoon, heavy rain moving in across the north of the UK, cloudy elsewhere and feeling raw in the southeasterly wind, a high of 6 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Philip Chrysikos. LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good afternoon to you. Four minutes past 12 is the time. Tom Swarbrick with you this afternoon on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday here with you this Valentine's Day. If you haven't got a card by now, if you haven't given a card by now, you are in the doghouse, I'm afraid. Uh, in half an hour's time, we'll talk about President, former President Donald J. Trump, acquitted for a second time by the Senate in the latest impeachment trial. Um, there were a few Republicans who decided to vote against party lines and voted to vote to impeach, but uh, not enough to see the former president impeached. He survives again and can run, critically, can run for public office again uh, if he were to choose to when the next election rolls around. So we'll get into the details of that in just a moment. But... The Foreign Secretary opened up a massive can of worms this morning in his interview with me on LBC. It's a Swarbrick on Sunday exclusive. The Foreign Secretary is saying that the government is keeping under consideration plans to introduce a COVID vaccine passport in the UK. As you know, the government have been in all sorts of uh, difficulties in terms of its public position on the need for COVID vaccine passports overseas. I think it's 
now publicly very clear that these things are going to be necessary. And so the government is working with other countries uh, around the world to come up with a system that is internationally recognised so once vaccinated we can go off and enjoy ourselves again. What's been less clear is whether or not they're looking at doing that domestically not least because it's not the government's lead on whether this happens. I think the critical thing here is that there are going to be companies across this country that for whatever reason decide they're not going to risk having a COVID outbreak in, in one of their shops or entertaining anti-vaxxers in one, whatever it is. They're going to decide to make it their own company policy to say, well, if you haven't had a vaccine, you're not coming in, sorry. We, we're going to allow you to come in only once you've produced a certificate that says that you've had it. I, I think there are companies that are going to do that. You look at um, mass gatherings of, of football crowds and things. Are we going to have, and it possibly might be quite a few people, it, the early part of the rollout for those under the age of 50, are we going to have large numbers of people to whom the vaccination programme has not reached going into big mass gathering events without a certificate saying that they've had it or failing to produce a certificate to say that they haven't? Are we going to entertain that risk even when, you know, COVID spread is possible amongst those that haven't been vaccinated and when the rollout hasn't got to those who are 20, those who are 30 yet? So to an extent, I, I think there is going to be some of this anyway. And Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, confirming for the first time considering the possibility uh, this is what he told this program and possible I think is Dominic Raab's suggestion there but the government absolutely are looking at this I put that to Mark Harper the chair of the Covid recovery group those are the backbench group of conservative MPs who are uh, trying to I think I would possibly stop at saying sceptical of lockdown, but are certainly trying to hold the government's feet to the fire and getting the country up and running again. Backbench group of Conservative MPs, this is what Mark Harper had to say to that suggestion a bit earlier when I asked him on the show. In the UK, I don't think we want to get to a position where we're telling people they can't do things unless they've been vaccinated with COVID. You might require them to be tested, for example, um, but what I don't think care we want to get to a position workers in, in care. Workers in care homes or hospitals, if they've, unfortunately, the figures don't look brilliant for um, take up amongst care workers. Um, if someone hasn't been vaccinated and, and wants to work in a care home, should they be allowed to? Well, I think you have to very much look at the risk uh, that people present. Um, there are, uh, my own view is that if you're a healthcare worker, it should be possible to persuade you to have a vaccination based on the very clear evidence. This is something the NHS will have to look at because clearly yeah. the priority is protecting um, the residents in the care home. Uh, and you have to look at the extent to which that person then presents a risk. Yeah. But for, for everyday life, I don't think you want to require people to have to have a particular medical procedure before they can go about their day-to-day -day life. That's not how we do things in Britain. Mark Harper, the chair of the COVID recovery group, Conservative MP, responding to Dominic Raab on this programme a little earlier. I told you about the can of worms it has opened. The, the response to that interview um, from lots and lots of people, certainly on social media, but calling the programme as well, saying this is, this is not how we do things in this country. We do not require uh, people to have undergone a medical procedure in order to access restaurants, supermarkets, shops, cafes, whatever it might be. We allow people the freedom to do that regardless of their health. And I think that, is, that absolutely is right. But we have seen massive changes to the way that we've lived our lives brought about by this. And even if it's only for the short term, how do you stop a business saying, we're not allowing anybody in that hasn't been vaccinated? How do you stop that? Do you, do you make a law that says that it would be too discriminatory to operate in that way? Because if there are businesses going to do that, and I, to be honest with you, I can see why they would, what should the government's responsibility be to come up with a system that actually works? Or is there a system that actually works that you can uh, alight upon that you think would be fair enough to allow people to have confidence in the vaccine rollout, to know that they're not going to come across as someone who's got coronavirus? Um, or it's too discriminatory, it's too unfair, and that's not how we live our lives, even if it were, uh, it were possible and were um, necessary. 0345 Let's go to Vince, who's in Chesterfield this morning. Hi there, Vince. Yes, good afternoon, Tom. Uh, this Sir. is getting ridiculous now with a domestic passport. I mean, how are we going to achieve this? I mean, stopping people from going in supermarkets. I mean, are we going to uh, let people starve because they haven't got a passport or something on the phones? What happens if a person hasn't got a phone and they can't prove it. Uh, I mean, this is just opening the black market up again, like in the Second World War. Uh, 
to to go into a supermarket and having to show that you've had the vaccine when it's essential to get food is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Well, here's a thought. I've got a thought, Vince. Ready? Right. Take the vaccine. Well, you, well, you, well, that is a fact. I won't be having the vaccine, but we can't dictate to people us... We might as well make it mandatory, and we might, and we might as well be a dictatorship. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, do you I mean, think having we... COVID vaccine passports to travel internationally is akin to a dictatorship, or is on the sort of cusp of dictatorship? No, no, that's, that's a different matter. We're talking about shops. I mean, to to get food to live. But in principle, why is it different? You're you're impeding people uh, from being able to choose to go overseas if they haven't been vaccinated. Why, in principle, is that different? I realise that. Uh, you know, for day-to-day -day life, that is is a much greater difference. But because, in principle, uh, why is it different to stopping people from, from doing anything else? It's not essential to go abroad. It is essential to get food. Some to people, for some people's work, it is. For some people to see family, it's essential. But there's a difference between flying uh, flying around the world to see family and, and eating to survive is a total different matter. To me, instead of keep doing the okie-cokie, I think we ought to settle down, wait till the deaths get below 100, infections below a couple of thousand, and just get there and let's reopen, no masks, no self-distancing, and let's get back to normal. This is just becoming more and more pathetic. I mean, I've never so known such... We are, now, we are now dictating that people must have the vaccine to go into shops and restaurants. I mean, well, no one's saying that yet, Vince. To be fair, nobody is saying that yet, but the government are saying that they are uh, considering, uh, that I mean, it is under been, consideration. We've been coming like, like Germany, get your papers out. We've got to see your papers. This is, this is a dictatorship. I mean... It's not a dictatorship. What's to stop, Vince, what stops a private company saying we don't want anyone in, in here who hasn't been vaccinated? It's now becoming a case where it's, it's going to be mandatory to have a, a vaccine to go into a shop. But, if, but, but to, to go back, it's not mandatory to have a vaccine. You can still choose not to. As like in anything in life, you can choose to do this, but, that and the other and it might affect what you can do later on. But Vince, let me... But, but, if, if, you, if it is a possibility that a company can say to, to all of us, sorry, you can't come in if you've not been vaccinated, doesn't the no. government have a responsibility to try and work something out? So, can I, so I can turn around to the staff in the shop and say, can I see your, vac uh, your passport then? Because if I've had it, I want to see yours. It's not a bad... It's a very good point. I, I, I think maybe you might be entitled to. Listen, Vince, thank you very much indeed. It goes to the question, actually, that was raised by a couple of other uh, companies that we shan't name because they've had enough publicity out of it, uh, who have said that you can't work for certain companies if you've not been vaccinated. The government have previously described that as unfairly discriminatory, that that would not be allowed. But you think about in care homes... Should people in care homes who haven't been vaccinated be allowed to work there? 0345 6060 the number 84850 to text. You can tweet at LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday exclusive. The Foreign Secretary saying it is under consideration the possibility of domestic vaccine passports. Come on to more of your thoughts in a few moments. Tom Swarbrick here. It's 12.14. This is LBC. <laughs>
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. Straight to your calls about the idea that under consideration are plans to introduce a domestic COVID vaccine passport, according to the Foreign Secretary. Paul's in Stratford-upon-Avon. Paul? I just think it's ridiculous. You know, what about if you don't want the vaccine or you're allergic to the vaccine, you know, and, and you can't have the vaccine or you don't want the vaccine? It's ridiculous saying you can't go to a supermarket or... You know, you can have the vaccine, it doesn't stop you getting the, uh, the virus, and it doesn't stop you transmitting the virus. So what's the point? If you don't want it, it's your personal choice. Absolutely. Just, of course it is. It, no one's, no, but no one's removing that choice from you, are they? No, but it sounds like they're going to. It's that everything comes, what they say, it does. But why would you, you choose know. not to? I get, Paul, for, the, for those people who are, who for whatever reason, I, can't, I don't know yeah. that there are many actually, for, who, for whatever reason at the moment cannot take a vaccine, that's a separate category. But for yeah. people who have chosen not to, why would you choose not to? Because, you know, I'm allergic to a lot of things and I, I wouldn't have the vaccine. I mean, I suffer from asthma. So if, mm-hmm. I, get the, if I get the virus, then, you know, it, it, it's game over for me. But I will not have the vaccine. Not at all. Hang on, hang on. So, so you're clinically vulnerable with yes, asthma, am, yeah. and you're yeah. and you're not going to take the vaccine no, that is that. proven I mean, I to stop you from being so homes. vulnerable. I know people eh? who work in nursing homes who won't have the vaccine. They'll have the sack. You know, there's a lot of side well, effects to the vaccine that you don't see. You know, well, I hang on. The side things. effects that they've talked about and that I've heard a lot about from callers who have had it are that people feel uh, they get possibly uh, slightly flu-like symptoms, they get a sore arm, uh, they feel uh, unwell for a few days, and that is an example of the vaccination working, as we heard from the deputy chair of the, the JCVI last week. But, Paul, you're, yes, you're yes, more yes. at risk of, of this. There's a lot of things that get un- don't get uncovered. There's a lot of things that go like into what? the carpet. You know, like I know what? a lady who works at a big nursing home and she won't have the vaccine. She sees old people dying after they've had the vaccine. So it, it should be your personal choice. And what is, the, what is the proof that they're dying because of the vaccine? How many people die of COVID who are dying of cancer? How many people dying of cancer? But now you're asking down? different questions, and that's fine. You're yeah, entitled know, to I'm, ask I'm them. I'm but leading you're, you're... down the same road. I'm leading down that road. Why should it be mandatory to have something that you don't want? All right, Paul, we'll leave it there. I, just, I, 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 don't, I don't understand how you are in a position where you are, you are knowingly more vulnerable to this thing. As you said, it's over for you if you get it because of your asthma and you're choosing not to get a vaccine that is proven to protect you. Uh, John's a new caller in Potter's Bar. John? I, uh, no, I just totally disagree with your views on, on the vaccine passport. Um, just let people have their own opinions, decide for themselves. If they want to take the vaccine, they take it. You're mm-hmm. protected. Once you take the vaccine, you're protected. So what are you worried about? Why are you trying to force others who don't want it to take it? Well, it depends on the level of people who don't want it, isn't it? If, if significant numbers of people choose not to take it, um, then we're going to have a problem with coronavirus circulating in quite a large way for, for some time to come. Aren't we? We if everybody influenza, takes it, the problem goes away. Cancer. We do we with do, influenza. Absolutely. We do with cancer. Yep. It's your choice if you've got... If you take up an uh, influenza vaccine, it's your choice. If you have uh, cancer treatment, it's your choice. It's your personal yeah. choice. So and I'm a business, John. I'm a business. I choose, because it's my choice, I choose that I don't want to have a business that has anybody in it who hasn't been vaccinated. What's to stop me doing that? Well, there's possibly laws that we could introduce to stop you from doing that. It's the same as... Oh, hang on, but this is my choice. Want, you want to, you want to legislate... You, you want to legislate. Well, that's a protected characteristic. You want to legislate to stop me being able to make a, a choice. That's unfair. Yeah, people are allowed to have their own personal opinions, aren't they? Oh, so we're not going to, to legislate to stop people doing opinions. that. I'm not to trying to control anyone's opinion. Well, you, you, you like want, you're the, well, well, John, you're the one that wants to bring in you're laws. You're the one who wants to insist everyone has the vaccine. <laughs> I want everyone to have the vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. I'm 100%, 100% everybody should have the vaccine. Yeah. Allergic reaction or if they've got cancer, blood cancer, that they can't take it. You if they really can't want to take it, if there are medical reasons why they can't take it, then they can't take it. But for people to choose not to when they're otherwise healthy seems so what mad about to me. they're mentally um, scared of taking it? What about if they don't want to take it because they're mentally scared of it or they just don't That's want to take it? They don't like vaccines. That's your choice. That's your choice. But, I'm not... so, but you want to stop them eating. You want to no. stop them going in a shop buying food. How ridiculous nope. are you sounding? You sound like a Nazi 
it's oh, song true, though. You really do. Love it. All right, John, I can't believe we got to Nazis. So you, you bypass the arguments here by just going straight to Nazis. We'll leave it there. David's in Hammersmith. David. Hiya. Oh, dear. What a dear. Do you know what? I hear these people, and what they're doing is they're playing a game I call Conspiracy Dominoes. They base their <laughs> argument on something that's complete bull, okay? Then that leads to another item that isn't going to happen, and that leads to another item that isn't going to happen. Now, in the NHS... You have to take certain vaccines if you're a nurse because they're so common, things like meningitis, um, hepatitis, and so on and so forth. We've been doing that for years, so it's clearly obvious that it should be a requirement for care homes. Nobody, no supermarket is ever going to say, you can't come in, show me your vaccine passport. They couldn't deal with the queues for a start. I think that's right. And who would They'd lose so much business. It's just complete BS, um, fantasy, fear... And you know what, if you, and you talk about this guy with the asthma, you know what I'd say to him? Make a will. Because seriously, he is vulnerable. Well, I now, hope he, he doesn't may, get he, ill, he David. I really die. hope he doesn't get ill. He may, he may not die, actually. There's worse things than dying. What there is worse is actually having uh, profound uh, lung infection, lung problems, um, and so on and so forth. I've got family members who've, who are right now mm. um, literally on, you know, can't can't go downstairs because mm. of their lungs. Okay, now the the fact that's that's long after COVID. That's long after other stuff. You get the same thing with COPD. Um, it's basically uh, scarred lungs, really bad damage, and it's irreparable. Nothing you mm -hmm. can do about it. It's done. Now, if you want, to, if you think you've been brave, great, go ahead. You can you can have the vaccine, or you can have the virus. It's fine. You know, well, or, David, listen, you know. that's why I don't understand but why people would choose not to. But on your point about conspiracy dominoes, unfortunately, for what, you know, the, 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 it is true to say that the Foreign Secretary said that under consideration were these plans to potentially look at the possibilities of domestic COVID um, passports. Now, that's not to say that, that it's going to happen. But if, no, if, but, if but this but is going to be led by... To, how, look at the dominoes you need to get... I mean, what are we... Uh, show and and we're already yeah it's happened really fast this week i mean it, I don't know what this says about the program but it seems to happen very quickly this week david listen thank you if people I, I, want their freedom to not have it etc that should be respected let them have that but they're not sitting on the train next to me hopefully or on the plane and they can go away and do their research they can study virology microbiology at the open university or whatever they want to do because I don't trust the doctor, but I don't think they should be allowed to infect and risk other people. Uh, well, uh, on on the, on overseas travel, you're you're okay because these things are going to have to happen. They're going to be brought in, but doing it inside the country feels like uh, a step that many many people will think is is absolutely not right and not needed. And actually. Thinking about it, it, once large numbers of people have been vaccinated, and we're talking about you know tens of millions of people, why would you need um, to be in a place where there's absolutely no COVID whatsoever because everybody in there has had the vaccine? If you've had it yourself, there's no risk. There isn't, but it's a mobile process, isn't it? It's a dynamic process. So when we get to that point, I personally would trust the authorities to make the correct call about winding it up or down depending on the severity yeah. but in the interim I, I was massively against id cards when they were mooted back in the day and i guess i still am but um i'm, I'm in belgium at the minute and they've got a really good off-the-shelf app which just checks test and trace that works essentially if there was that that was legally enforced and it beeped and you had to quarantine I just, aka a passport a passport on your app to access mm. pubs to access clubs to access sports matches and then yeah. And you think you're in Chuck Communist China. Uh, you've heard the calls to the programme so far. With argument, but but that, with an app. Erin, that's, uh, that's an argument against the method of introduction. And I would agree with you. If you haven't yes, got a mobile phone, absolutely. they have to do something if they're going to bring this in for people so, without one. Yes, exactly. And also, I do feel it's like a form of medical tyranny. You're saying, oh, OK... Um, if you haven't had the vaccine, you can't go shopping, you can't go to the supermarket. It's fair enough in specific jobs which we could legislate for, 
and for international travel, just like you have your yellow fever vaccine, yeah. um, and for specific jobs like working in the health service and so on. But to say that absolutely every member of society has to do this is going to leave a whole load of people excluded, especially things like the black and Asian ethnic minority communities who have got a very low uptake. Where are they going to be in all of this? And so it's well, like we're, again, I we're mean, forcing I do, I do some think... people into a, a, a sort of black market or a world of... Uh, the non-vaccinated versus the vaccinated, a bit like California. But that is the world, isn't it? I mean, but, but Erin, that that is the world. It is. <laughs> there are vaccinated people and there are unvaccinated people. And right if now, if you're vaccinated, you've got no problem, have you? So why no. are you complaining about the non-vaccinated? It's those people that will be taking the Because if the, the transmissibility, personally. if the transmissibility of the virus is uh, still possible once those people have been vaccinated, which I think, but depending on the data, it still hospital, seems to be. Will they? That's but, the point. Well, they the won't. The vaccine but, means you won't end up in hospital. So what are you worried about? But you it's know, not if a about me, people, Erin. Erin, stop. It's not about me. It's about protecting the NHS. If large numbers of people in this country choose not to have the vaccine, large enough that if people were to uh, get coronavirus and fall very, very ill, the numbers would overwhelm the NHS, then we've got a real problem. It won't overwhelm it, though, will it? Because we'll have quite a well, high uptake. I don't uptake. know. We'll have quite a high uptake. And if we're then, and, and it looks like this particular policy or whatever it is that's being discussed is to attempt to force people to have the vaccine uh, subtly no one is or forcing not so you. subtly no but can't you see that this is what this looks like i can see erin i can it see looks how like a form of tyranny if you don't take it you can't go shopping how many people are going to panic about that even yep. if they have fairly valid personal reasons why they don't want to yep. take it and they're willing on their personal level to risk that they've paid into the nhs they've paid their taxes they deserve treatment, whether they've okay, had a vaccine Aaron, listen, or not. Are we listen, going to get to that point? You've had a very good say. I, I don't think it is going to be reasonable for every supermarket in this country to turn away people from their doors who hasn't been vaccinated. I don't think that is going to be a reasonable proposition. I don't think that's one that anyone is going to say we should live by. How you stop, because you would have to choose to stop some companies from mandating that either their staff or the patrons that come into their premises have been vaccinated in order to, to come in or to work for them, is a is a is a live question, clearly in government, because they've said this morning that they are considering it. Erin, uh, thank you. 03456060973. We'll talk Trump later in his uh, acquittal by the Senate in that second impeachment trial. Tom Swarbrick here, 1231. News headlines, Tim Humphrey. The Foreign Secretary has told LBC the government hasn't ruled out a coronavirus vaccine passport for people to have access to travel, shopping and work. Over 65s and those classed as clinically vulnerable in England are now being invited to book their vaccines. Dominic Raab also says he doesn't think arbitrary targets could be set in easing coronavirus lockdown rules. It follows calls from some Tory MPs to ensure they're fully lifted by the end of April. The ban on bailiff enforced evictions in England is being extended to protect renters during the pandemic. It will stay in place for all but the most serious cases for another six weeks. And the weather becoming milder from the west later with many areas seeing heavy rain, a high of 10. LBC.
is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Here's Anthony on Twitter who doesn't give an opinion on whether or not he thinks these domestic vaccine passports should happen, but never says this, which is important. He says, Tom, transmissibility equals threat of mutation equals threats for those who were vaccinated. And in that, he's summing up the, the scientific consensus. The more cases there are, the more chances of mutation, the more chances of mutation, the possibility exists that it could get around the vaccine. That being said... All of this, I think, this domestic passport stuff, uh, um, COVID passport stuff, is dependent on the take-up of the vaccine. The more people that have it, the larger proportion of the country that takes this thing, the much less requirement there would be for any system like this to be implemented. 0345 973 is the number. Let's get a view from uh, business on this. Peter Marks joins us, Chief Executive of Recom UK, Britain's largest nightclub operator. Thank you for joining us on the programme this afternoon, Mr Marks. What say you to the idea of uh, requiring patrons of your clubs to show a COVID vaccine passport before they came in? Well, uh, I have to say that I, I can understand people being pretty horrified, but I think most people in the nightclub world think that they'd listen to anything that's going to get them back because we've been shut for very nearly a year. Um, unlike most of hospitality, we've not been able to open at all. Uh, but then again, can you imagine it? Uh, it means that those that would have the vaccine right now would be all over uh, 70 years old. Um, so it would have a club full of 70 year olds that are the only people that could come in. So you can see flaws in it all over the place. But you know, it's it's a, it's a crazy world. Now, I do understand why people uh, would be upset with with their liberty, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, we've got to do something to get back to normality. We cannot have we cannot just sit back and wait for every business in the country to die um, simply because uh, you know, there are those in in the science uh, community that are so uh, conservative and cautious mm. uh, that you know that uh, we'll never get back. I mean, we we thought we were going to get back last um, autumn. Look what happened. So you, I mean, in theory, given the vaccine rollout thus far has, has reached the top four priority groups, um, you could open your nightclub to all those who have been vaccinated without the risk of, of COVID spreading at all, as long as you knew who they were. Well, yes, in theory. But of course, my customers are all aged between 18 and, uh, and 25. Uh, so I, think there's a, I think there's a good niche for you here, Mr. Marks, to get, to get the <laughs> coffers swelling again. I can just see all the 70 year olds banging my doors down and, and not, uh, you know, and, and can't wait to get dancing in. But listen, um, you know, this is a very divisive uh, discussion, of course. And, I, you know, and I've heard some of the comments that have come on before. Mm. Uh, it certainly uh, appears uh, that a lot of people are thinking of themselves rather than sort of what is good for society. And I understand that. But, it, you know, you are going to end up with lots of people who, who, who don't want to get uh, the vaccine. And, and then they'd be barred from going shopping or going to nightclubs or going to pubs and clearly that's going to be seen as a, a, a political well a, a bit of a mess yes uh, but just thinking further down the line then once the uh, a vaccine is offered to every adult in the country and you're able to reopen in whatever form um yeah. are you going to want to know who in your club at any particular moment has been vaccinated and who hasn't because if you were to have a large proportion of the people in there who had not for whatever reason been vaccinated you could have another super spreader event amongst those people? Well, I think, first of all, a bit like the schools, most of our customers are young enough and healthy enough to, to not be affected. So the only issue is the super spreader. Uh, we're not talking about vaccine passports for schools, are we? So, you know, no. frankly, it should be the same for us. Uh, uh, you know, listen, people should be able to make the right choices for themselves as to where they want to go. They should know what their risk is uh, and, and, and they should act accordingly and they should have the freedom. Um, my point really at the beginning is, but goodness only knows, we've heard so many stories about how we're going to get back and what protocols we'd have to have and, you know, lateral flow tests and screens and sprays and all the sort of things that nightclubs just won't fit in with. If the only way that we could come back was to have the vaccinated uh, passport uh, as, as the thing that became acceptable to government, then, you know what, we'd have to give it a go, wouldn't we? But it's not where we want to be. Let's get you up and running as soon as possible. Peter Marks, thank you very much indeed for your time. You're the Chief Executive of Recom UK, Britain's largest nightclub operator. 20 to 1 is the time. Let's come back to your calls. Norda is a new caller to the show in Richmond-upon-Thames. Hello, Norda. Hi, how are you? Yes, I'm good, thank you. Your thoughts on yeah. this? 
Good, good, good. Uh, my thoughts are, um, I think that it's not up for discussion, quite frankly. There's a pandemic, and my husband works for the NHS. He has for 12 hours a day, six days a week since last March. And, you know, he has witnessed the the worst part of this. And I, I don't mm-hmm. know why there's a conversation. I know that people believe in their rights and their freedoms and all this, but this isn't the time to do that. We have to solve the problem. It's an obvious uh, step in logic. You know, so if you're going to disagree with the vaccine, that's completely fine. Don't get vaccinated, but don't go into a store. (laughs) Don't go, you know, and believe me, I'm not some rigid, you know, I'm all for freedom. But there's a pandemic out there. Yeah, Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah, no, I'm sorry to sound so rigid, but. No, no, no. It's a bad time. We're in, we're in, um, we're in all sorts of bother when it comes to uh, the freedoms that we once used to enjoy and how they have been eroded as a result yeah. of the pandemic and necessarily because of the pandemic. But Norda, just let me, on the logic of it, mm-hmm. if if you are the only person going to a supermarket that hasn't had the COVID vaccine once yeah. it's been offered to every adult, what's the risk in you coming in? I, you, you know what? Do the math. It just takes one person. I'm sorry. Do, doesn't that It make takes sense? one person to what? It doesn't take one person to... Because everyone who else has been vaccinated... Yeah, but then you're counting on... Air, so the only reason you're allowed to go in without being vaccinated is because everyone else has taken the responsibility to get vaccinated. So basically, they're mm. doing your job for you, aren't they? Okay. So why Norda, do you hang on the line. go in? Sorry? Norda, hang on the line. Hang on the okay. line. I want to bring in Carol, who's in Watford. Stay there, Norda. Hi, Carol. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Tom. Hi there. What do you make of what Norda's saying? She's seen her husband's been at the sharp end of this. Yeah, um, I used to be a nurse and I am I was very pro vaccine. I always have had. And then in nineteen ninety three I had a flu vaccine which sort of finished my life because I collapsed. I've been ill for twenty seven odd years. I have ME very badly. I was in bed for years. Due to this, um, it's been put down in my notes as a severe reaction to the flu mm-hmm. vaccine. I've got a letter in front of me that I had from my doctor. I saw him last week dating discussion about COVID vaccination, however, has had a significant reaction in 1993 to flu vaccination so so not carol are you going to be yeah. sorry to move you to the point are you going to yeah. be unable to have a vaccine i'm not allowed right because so I've norda, had, nor- um, yeah i've got contraindications against it yeah okay norda mm. what should happen to people like carol then for whom this isn't it's not going to be possible um, sadly, I believe that, that there should be some type of other accommodations where, like, maybe someone who has been vaccinated can go in and shop for her. I know maybe that's, I know that yeah. that might not be possible. I get that. I totally appreciate that. I just think that there's a, there's a, there's a something out there that is spreading and we have to stop no. it or our whole economy is going to collapse. I mean, no, there are times, Carol? I mean, there are such things as masks. Sorry, I, you know, I, there are such things as masks. We can wear yes, masks. Yes, it, I, I agree with you so, completely. I mean, you know, this is not what I was think. What I was saying to the uh, gentleman I spoke of before when mm-hmm, I found mm-hmm. out. I said, "What do you do? Do you show a blue passport?" And mine is a pink one because mm. they know that then I cannot take it. You say that it's actually disgusting. I do mm. think it's disgusting because mm. it's showing who can, who can't, and it's, mm. it is free will. I do take that, but I th- I do feel that those who choose not mm. to take it um, wear masks and be sensible. Well, I have yeah, to say, no, Carol, for, uh, you, for you, sorry to interrupt, ladies. Uh, Carol, thank yeah. you, Norda, thank you. For you, Carol, it does seem like the element of choice is removed if, for a medical reason, you're... you're uh, your doctor is advising you not to take the vaccine for now. Um, it seems like the element of choice has gone for you and therefore a different set of circumstances. Were this thing to be introduced, and there is absolutely no guarantee that it will, but were this to be introduced, you would fall into a different category, Carol, for which there needs to be some accommodation, clearly. Thank you for your calls. 03456060973, the number. More in just a moment. We'll talk about Trump too and his second impeachment acquittal by the Senate. Uh, we'll get the details on that in just a moment. 12.45. Coming up at one on LBC, Majid Noirs. Parliament's COVID recovery group has demanded that the government lift all lockdown restrictions by April. Is this holding the government to account or holding them to ransom? 
Budget Noirs on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. 12.49 The Times, Stephen asks on Twitter, Tom, is it fair to ask how long the supposed vaccine passports will be in place for? P.S. I've had the vaccine. Stephen, it's a great question. Uh, not only about when, if they are going to be introduced domestically, they certainly are internationally, but if they're going to be introduced domestically, at what stage are they introduced? How long they're kept in place for? What happens for those people who choose not to have the vaccine? What happens to their lives and abilities to uh, express their freedom? These are all great questions that I do think the government are right to be thinking about even if in the end they decide that we don't need domestic vaccine passports in this country because take-up rates of, of the vaccine have been so good. In the event that they're, you know, how long do we hold over 70s or all those that have been offered both doses of the vaccine, how long do we hold them back from being allowed, from going and, and living their lives? They're out of this now. They've, they've got both doses. They can 
they can crack on? Do they need to be able to show a bit of paper to say, right, we've we've been vaccinated, we can do what we like? 0345 6060 973 is the number. Come back to your calls on that in just a tick. Let's talk about what happened in the United States over the course of the wee small hours. Former President Donald Trump acquitted by the Senate in his second impeachment trial. Lynn Sweet is the Washington Bureau Chief at the Chicago Sun-Times. Thank you for joining us the, this afternoon, uh, Lynn Sweet. Tell us what happened inside the Senate at this at the end of this trial. Well, here's what was remarkable is that for the second time, President, uh, ex-President Trump, in a sense, beat the rap. And even though the, the majority of senators voted to convict him, you needed two thirds or 67 votes. And he didn't have that. So he was acquitted. But here's what's interesting. The leader of the Republicans, once the vote was done and once seven Republicans joined the Democrats to vote to convict the former president. And Mitch McConnell gave a stirring speech about how guilty the president was. Well, this is just after he voted not guilty. And then the, a, a speech that was so strong, you would have thought this was a prosecutor speaking about how mm. the former president was directly responsible for the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, but there was a uh, legal technicality in a sense that uh, this uh, Republican leader used to explain why he couldn't vote to convict. But uh, mm. they, he more or less hopes that authorities investigating the former president for many other things uh, pursue, pursue their probes. Well, I, you know, a technicality in law, it's the right thing then to not find someone guilty of, of something, perhaps, legally, but clearly morally, uh, people believe him to be. What next then for the Republican Party and for former President Trump? Well, for former President Trump, he put out a statement uh, very shortly after the vote saying that he pretty soon uh, he will uh, we get to work on his uh, building his movement. So we'll be hearing from him. He had been unusually mm. quiet. A uh, part of it is yes, he hasn't said anything, Twitter has he at all? Yeah. No, uh, he he has a, a, an office that has put out statements that have been uh, tempered and modest and few. So we're bracing on what to hear uh, mm. that he is disgraced in the minds of part of the Republican Party. I don't think will ta- will uh, limit his political power right now. Uh, and the Republican Party in the United States uh, will is, is in crisis and is at a crossroads. And we'll see if this uh, becomes a civil war. Good to talk to you, Lynn Sweet. Thank you very much. Washington Bureau Chief at the Chicago Sun-Times. 12.53, Ashling is in Bromley. Hi, Ashling. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me Hello. on. Hello. No problem. Hi, yeah. Nice talking today. Um, uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to say in terms of vaccine passports, I think it's just, it, it is really indirect um, mandatory vaccination because it would just create so much discrimination because I just think there are so many reasons that people might not want to take a vaccine. You know, personally, I, I would have fears, but I, I would just like to say I will take it. But mm-hmm. I just think that you just don't get anywhere by force, and this is sort of indirectly forced. Um, I, 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 mean, if you can imagine, I just wonder, Ashling, yeah. if the, th- thinking about if this were to be introduced, how it would be introduced, and when it would be introduced, there is, as you say, there is no sense in punishing a tiny percentage of people who choose not to have the vaccine by telling them they can't go into shops when there is no risk, if huge numbers of people get vac- vaccinated, of this thing spreading around too much and the NHS uh, bec- coming under pressure. But right now, there's going to come a point where a small but not insignificant minority of people have received both doses. Are we going to tell them that they have to live their lives under the lockdown restrictions that everybody else is having to live by? I think in that case, no. I think that people who have had both vaccinations should possibly have more liberties. Um, just and how are we going you know, to know that both that, that that person who's not wearing a mask, who's not social distancing, who's charging around like it's you know their birthday every day, how are we going to know that they have been... Uh, had two jabs? I think it shouldn't apply to more basic things like, uh, say, maybe non essential retail or restaurants opening, but for things like travel, maybe it could be, you know, useful for that. Like, I know holiday companies are 
um, you know, are looking mm-hmm. at vaccine passports and things like that. So I think in situations like that, it might be useful. I mean, it's always going to create a division, but if, if it's a division based yes. on a time scale, that's different to a division based on yes. a personal preference or, I, I, you know, I, because I, I, I agree. people can be so opinionated about why somebody might not want to vaccine. If you can, you can imagine being held down and injected for whatever reason. There's a multitude of reasons that could happen to people. Um, or even if it's in your ancestry, there's going to be an innate fear there. Yes, and I, just I understand that. I understand that. And, and it's uh, yeah. Yes, and persuading people and gentle cajoling and all the rest of it. Yeah. But nobody is going to be held down and vaccinated. Ashing, I have to move on because other people want to get on, but thank you so much for your call. Uh, Chantal is in Blackheath. Chantal. Oh, Hi. Hi. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, while I'm definitely for the vaccine, some of us might not be eligible to have it. Um, I just wonder how having a vaccine passport would affect us. I'm currently pregnant, um, about to have my second child, but I wouldn't be eligible for the vaccine. Thank you. Um, because number one, I'm pregnant. Number two, I plan to breastfeed my child. So um, it's not something that would be offered to me because I'm, even though I might persuade mm. my GP to let me have it, I, I'm not a high risk group. Um, I just wonder how that would then affect our life going forward if we are meant to have this. Um, what I what I don't think Chantel would be right or sensible or needed is. To have vaccination passports once every adult in the country has been offered a jab and the overwhelming majority, as seems to be the case from the take-up of of the first groups, um, the overwhelming majority have had it. Because then the risk to the NHS is gone. And then it really is a personal choice. Or in in your case, for the length of your pregnancy, it's uh, something that your GP has advised you not to do. Or going forward until I decide not to press you. It's just, I think, it's going to be a matter of wearing what I want to do with my child and then... I think it's really difficult because then it also goes down to other issues that I have personally. I mean, we have moved here as an expat family. We have all our family abroad. Um, I mean, I have elderly parents and grandparents that um, if we are going to need a vaccine passport means that I might never see them. <laughs> it oh, Chantal, that's so hard. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely so a difficult as well. I completely understand where the government's sort of coming from with this and I would happily have it if... I mean, if it was offered to me, but in circumstances that we're not able to, mm. it's it's really a difficult position to be in. No, I completely agree. And it's a, an additional stress on what what is already hopefully not too stressful a time for you during pregnancy, but is an, a, an added worry. Chantal, thank you. Uh, final word to Karen in Nottingham this afternoon. Karen, hi. Hi. Uh, hi. You're on the radio. Hi. I'm afraid you've only got about 30 seconds, Karen. Right. OK. Well, it's my job to look after my health. And it's the government's job to look after my rights. And I think people have lost sight on where our rights are and our responsibilities and being told about vaccines, staying in, going out, doing this, doing that. We're not communist China. We are the UK. But how would you do you tell the person over the age of 70 who's received both doses that they have to stay in this form of lockdown until the whole country has been offered a dose? I don't think you should be telling anything. I don't think anybody needs to be telling anything about their health. People are adults and they can make the decisions right. about the health. I know, the but we're sort of... With, with, I know, Karen, Karen, I know, I know all this. We know all this. We've been around this a number of times. I, I, I under, we're past this point. We're not locking down because the recovery rate is, is 99% or indeed the, the mortality rate is around 1%. We're locking down to protect the NHS. Karen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for all your calls, text, tweets over the course of the programme. Back with you tomorrow night, 10pm, for the Late Night Show with Tom Swarbrick, Mondays to Thursdays, 10pm on LBC. Do join me then if you can. Swarbrick on Sunday, next Sunday, 10am. Have yourself a good Valentine's Day. At four, it's Ian Payne. Right now, Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Tom. Coming up, more than 600 people working in Amazon warehouses have been seriously injured or narrowly avoided an accident in the last four years. Meanwhile, workers at Facebook are seeking to establish unions as well. Do staff at UK big tech firms need stronger union representation? Before that, just weeks into the Biden presidency, officials are said to be deeply disappointed with their European allies who have been keeping their distance and showing an unwelcome affinity towards China in the EU, potentially tilting America back towards Britain. Does recent EU posturing on vaccines, China trade and Ireland bode well for Britain's relationship with America. But first, the lockdown sceptic parliamentary COVID recovery group, the CRG, said all restrictions must be lifted by the end of April. Is this holding the government to account or holding them to ransom?